Thank you, uh, coll colleagues. Um, welcome to the fifth meeting of the Devolution for the Powers Committee. Um, the first item on the agenda this morning is a declaration of interest. But before I do that, um, just to say a couple of words about the fantastic contribution that Annabel Goldie made to the deliberations of the committee on the earlier referendum bill committee, but obviously now in regard to the devolution for the powers committee. Her presence here was very much valued by everybody around the table, and I know she put in some you know, fantastic efforts on her behalf, so thanks to Annabel. With that, though, um, Alex Johnson, can I invite you to declare any relevant interests? Thank you very much, convener. I have uh, studied my uh, entry in the Register of Members' Interests and believe that there are no matters that I require to bring to the, your attention. I'm very grateful to you. Um, <clears throat> I think we've also got one apology from Stuart Maxwell. <coughs> well, first of all, can I, can I welcome the, the Right Honourable Alistair Comeco, the Secretary of State for Scotland this morning, to our deliberations, and, uh, and, al and, al and also Chris Platt, who I think is your Principal Private Secretary. I've got that title right, Chris. And thank you for agreeing, Alistair, to appear so quickly after the Smith Commission's report came out. It's very helpful to us and able to get the, uh, begin to get an understanding of both the UK and the Scottish Government's perspectives later. We're just going to ask some general questions at the beginning. We'll go through some of the tax issues, some of the welfare issues, uh, perhaps come back to constitutional things uh, uh, towards the end. But if I could just kick off by bringing this back to one of the things we had a discussion with Lord Smith about, um, and that's in regard to the Smith Commission's report. The paragraph 21 uh, and seeking to entrench the constitutional position of the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government as permanent institutions. Um, Lord Smith said to us um, <laughs> on Tuesday morning, if you know a way of making the institution permanent, tell me, because that's the Scottish people's will. I think we all recognise the challenge here, but I just wondered what measures you might be aware of that could be taken to entrench such a concept of permanence and enhance the autonomy of the institutions of the Government and Parliament beyond merely stating it in primary legislation? And has any consideration been given to alternative models that may exist in other jurisdictions, for example, in that regard? Hey, right. Good morning, Convener. Th thank you for the invitation. I'm, I'm pleased to offer you the chance to make an opening statement if you want well, to. Well, so hey, I apologise. Do that hey, first hey, if you wish. Hey, no, in fact, uh, given that I know that the committee is pressed for time this morning, I I'll, I'll waive that uh, and okay. I'm sure we can just uh, cut to the chase, uh, so to speak, beyond perhaps just putting on uh, record my appreciation of Lord Smith and those who assisted him from the party uh, representatives. I see we have a couple of them here this morning and the Secretariat. Um, I'm pleased to be here today at this stage because, as you say, uh, it is early days since the report was received, but we are working to a tight timetable here, and I recognise that for you to give this the proper scrutiny that you will want to do as parliamentarians, that uh, it's necessary that we all make uh, a special effort in, in, in this regard. Um, and I anticipate that there will be further uh, occasions of this nature for myself and other ministers in the future. And uh, just perhaps one of the, the things that I thought was very useful in uh, the Smith report was his observation about the opportunity that there is for better joint working between the parliaments. Um, we've always uh, had different mechanisms for joint working between the governments and occasionally you get instances like today where I'm here as a minister talking to you as parliamentarians and in the past we've had Scottish government ministers in London before parliamentary committees there. But parliament to parliament dialogue I think is something that we've never quite got right and I think that's one of the, the opportunities as we, we look at that. Uh, to come to your question about the, the entrenchment, um, in fact, I think the answer to your question is, is contained within your question. De facto, uh, the permanence of the Scottish Parliament uh, is uh, guaranteed by the will of the Scottish people. Uh, that was the claim, the claim of right that uh, was signed up to in the 90s as part of the Constitutional Convention. Uh, and for all practical purposes, it's unthinkable that you would not now have a, within the United Kingdom a, a, a Scottish Parliament. Uh, I fully accept the point, though, that whatever the de facto position is, the de jure one is a rather more challenging 
uh, prospect because uh, within the current uh, United Kingdom constitution you only really have the mechanism of primary legislation. Um, now I think uh, if nothing else is clear at the moment it's pretty clear that you have a, an emerging constitutional position not just in Scotland but across the whole of the United Kingdom you will be aware that the Labour Party and my own party are both committed to having a UK-wide constitutional convention and I think that that is exactly the sort of issue that could be dealt with there. Ultimately, it might require us coming to a position of having some sort of written constitution, something for which uh, I have uh, always been something of an enthusiast. Um, but in the meantime, do you really want to get too hooked up on the de jure position when you consider that, in fact, uh, the, uh, the, the permanence of the UK's position within the European Union was down to a piece of primary legislation, uh, the European Communities Act 1972, um, which uh, has, has uh, sort of maintained our position and the position of the communities and then the, the union subsequently. So um, I, I, uh, I'm open to, to different ways that you could achieve that. I think it would be healthy uh, as part of a wider piece of constitutional reform if we could entrench it uh, in, in legislation. But as I say, I think the biggest guarantee is, is the will of the Scottish people. Yeah, um, it was interesting, um, Lord Smith's perspective on this, and his, he claimed that obviously if anything like w w was to happen and, and it wasn't continued along the will of the Scottish people, then mm -hmm. there would be a plague or boils or something will break out. Now, well, obviously, we don't want that to happen. Well, well so indeed. A, a, there's a, a suggestion being made to me, and, I, and I'm glad you said you're open to suggestions that mm -hmm. there might be a possibility, and I'd just like to explore mm -hmm. that. You might not be able to give a lot of detail today. Sure. It might be something worth looking at, though. Yeah. Um, in the post-colonial period, when the Autonomy Acts were passed for post-colonial areas, they also contained a Charter of Autonomy. Uh, and, and obviously, we're not in a post-colonial situation. understand that. But if there was a, an autonomy act that had a charter of autonomy in it that would reserve certain functions and powers to the institutions of the UK, then I'm, it's been suggested to me certainly that that's a potential avenue to be able to entrench the Scottish Parliament powers because we may have to wait some time, obviously, and we don't know how long we'd have to wait. We might never get it to the written constitution position. So all I'm asking is, is that something you're prepared to explore and have a look at? I'd be prepared to explore it. Uh, I mean, uh, as Secretary of State for Scotland, uh, I'm constitutionally the guardian of the, uh, the, the, the devolution settlement. So this is something that I can legitimately have a look at. The immediate question that comes to my mind is, uh, how do you entrench the charter? <laughs> Uh, and it seems to come back to primary legislation um, at, at that point. Um, but, you know, it, it's, I mean, this is something. Yeah. Uh, and the, the nature of, of sovereignty is something that has exercised jurists uh, for, for centuries. Um, and uh, many years ago, uh, I had the great good fortune, uh, <coughs> perhaps, to have to study as an undergraduate uh, jurisprudence and the point at which uh, sovereignty shifts and, and crystallises. Um, uh, but um, a charter um, perhaps uh, might uh, draw on, on the way in which the, the Treaty of Union was then uh, enacted in the Act of Union. So, um, uh, you know, I've, all these things can be looked at, but for the moment, um, you know, I think my priority is working to the timetable that we've got yeah, for the implementation of Smith. And, uh, you know, we, if there's a way of, of achieving the, uh, the higher level stuff, then I'm in the market for... for okay, well, that's very it. helpful. If, if you could write to us at some stage, just let Certainly. us know what the response to yeah. that would, that would be most useful. Louis McDonald. Thanks very much. Uh, and good morning, Secretary of State. I was interested in uh, partly following on Bruce's line of questioning because clearly the Smith Agreement is, is implicitly and explicitly uh, about a stronger Scottish Parliament within the United Kingdom. And I wondered, as Secretary of State uh, for Scotland within the UK Cabinet, what discussions you've ha had with colleagues about any implications there may be from the agreement 
for devolved arrangements elsewhere in the UK or, or indeed for the wider UK constitutional position? Well, uh, within the Cabinet, um, the, uh, the, 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 the conversations surrounding the Smith Commission report have been uh, pretty uh, brief uh, along the lines of uh, we committed to implementing the uh, conclusions of Lord Smith's uh, inquiries and deliberations. Uh, we now have these and we will implement them and I don't think an awful lot more conversation is necessary than that. Uh, there are other uh, aspects of the wider UK constitution though that is uh, or that are very much in, in play. You will have heard the comments of the Prime Minister in regard to the question of English votes for English laws, for example. You will know that the, the Cabinet now has a Cabinet <coughs> subcommittee uh, chaired by the, uh, the, the Leader of the House of Commons and uh, Vice Chair is the Chief Secretary to the Treasury that is looking uh, at that question. Um, the parties within the coalition have different views on that um, and uh, your own party has been invited to contribute to that discussion. We have a, an anticipated command paper setting out the different options on that uh, sometime before Christmas, I believe. Um, and, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the discussions will proceed uh, after that. Ultimately, I think it will be more of an issue to be determined at the, uh, the, the next general election in May and, and possibly even thereafter. One of the things that was clear from Lord Smith's evidence on Tuesday was that both the UK government and the Scottish government played a significant role in relation to the Smith Commission in terms of the provision of expert advice and uh, information. Clearly, while the headlines have been written, a lot of the detail remains to be worked through. What is your uh, role in ensuring that that input continues and that that dialogue continues at expert level and official level to ensure that uh, the, the, the detail is worked through in the most effective way. It's my job to deliver the draft clauses according to the timetable which takes us to the 25th of January um, and uh, you know that's my responsibility, it's my head that's on the block uh, if we d were not to meet that target. Obviously it's going to be important that we maintain the best, closest uh, dialogue with the Scottish Government, with their officials. Uh, ministers, these discussions uh, are already uh, ongoing, uh, especially at uh, an official level. Um, I myself am meeting the, the First Minister this afternoon and I would anticipate that this will form a, a significant part of the discussions that we will be having. Um, uh, and a, I also announced last week uh, that to uh, assist with the implementation and uh, the, the business thereafter, or, or the scrutiny once we have the draft clauses, will be setting up a stakeholder group so that we keep the wider range of engagement uh, uh, that we had in the course of the Smith Commission um, uh, <coughs> as we uh, move towards the formulation of the, the, the draft clauses. Thanks, Lewis. Uh, Mark McDonald. Uh, thank you very much, Commissioner, and good, good morning, Mr. Carmichael. Um, some of the powers that are outlined in the Smith Commission report will require primary legislation, but some will not. There are some which could be transferred by Section 30 orders, some which could be done through other arrangements. For example, uh, votes at 16, which obviously there is an expectation of that being in place in time for the 2016 Scottish elections. Also, air passenger duty, for example, would not necessarily require primary legislation in order for that to be transferred. Is there, does the UK government have a view on whether there should be a disaggregation of some of the recommendations and some should be um, fast-tracked where possible? Obviously, that could be viewed as a, a gesture of good faith and a down payment on, on future powers. To, what, what's the view on that? Um, well, I, I think the expectation at the moment is still that this will proceed as a package given the range of issues with which we are dealing here and the somewhat tight time frame uh, on which we are working. Um, having said that, however, since you mention votes at 16, you may have seen that I was speaking about this on Monday uh, and it is clear that if we were to meet the 
uh, deadline for uh, an extended franchise for the 2016 elections to the Scottish Parliament that it would require to be done uh, more quickly. Uh, I have tasked the officials within the Scotland office to uh, come forward with proposals about how I could do that. Uh, so, you know, that would be one obvious uh, exception to the, uh, the, the general principle. Um, air passenger duty, uh, you're right, wouldn't necessarily need primary legislation, but once you're talking about the transfer of taxation powers and uh, the, you know, the, the, the budgetary consequences that come with that, I think there is uh, probably a greater interest in ensuring that you get the whole thing uh, as a package rather than, than taking it in drips and drabs. Uh, obviously, the, the question around votes at 16, one of the ways that it could be resolved, obviously, is a, a UK-wide approach, given that we've got a UK election coming up in, in six months' time. Um, and speaking to a modern studies class in my constituency, their question was, why were we trusted to vote on Scotland's constitutional future, but we don't seem to be trusted to vote on who's the Prime Minister. Um, is there a UK government view on, on votes at 16 on a pan-UK basis? Uh, there's not. I mean, there's a range of views within the government. Um, the, uh, and, you know, I think within that range of views, my own and yours are, are pretty similar. Uh, I would like to see votes at 16 across the whole of the United Kingdom. The answer to your, your modern studies class, of course, is that it would require primary legislation. Uh, that's not going to happen now uh, in time to do the necessary legwork in terms of uh, extending the register for a general election in May. Uh, so realistically, uh, that's not going to happen. Um, but uh, I think it could be done both in terms of legislation if you were to take, for example, a Section 30 order route and uh, the, the, the necessary um, renewal of the, the, the registration process in time for 2016. Uh, and I would be very keen that that should happen. So, um, you know, I can't sit here and give you a cast iron guarantee uh, this morning. As the convener said, we're still in the very early days uh, of the, the Smith report. But uh, with goodwill and joint working, because of course Section 30 does require the two governments to work together, um, I would think that that should be achievable. Okay. Um, on, on, the, on the wider issue then, d is there a timescale envisaged uh, in relation to, I mean, we know we've spoken about 25th January for the clauses, but when, when would you envisage um, these powers being on the statute books? When would we expect to see them in place in this, in this parliament at our disposal? The implementation of a, uh, yeah. a Smith bill? Yes. Well, uh, you'll have the general election in May and a Queen's speech, I would imagine, before the end of May. If we have the work done on the draft clauses and there has been some pre-legislative scrutiny, I would suggest probably um, by a, a committee or committees here and in the House of Commons. That would make, uh, make a degree of sense to my mind. I would not uh, see any barrier to there being an early introduction of that bill. Um, and indeed, I think the expectation would be that there would be an early introduction of that bill. It being a constitutional bill, it would require to go through uh, the House of Commons on the floor. It wouldn't be taken uh, in committee. Uh, so that will add a bit to the, uh, the, the, the time scale that uh, is given over to it. Um, but uh, I would anticipate that you would have a, a, a bill that would uh, be through both houses um, by the end of, of next year, maybe early 2016. It's, it's, it's difficult always to predict. I think the important thing about the passage of the bill if I go back to my own uh, recent past as a, one of the party's business managers in the Commons, the fact that you've got a, a mandate for a bill of this sort, having been through a general election and a commitment from the three parties, means that it would be very difficult for... Uh, sorry, sorry. No, it's okay. I'm just... But, apologies. Uh, so, uh, it would be very difficult uh, for, for any party in either house to uh, resist it. Just Mark, I'll come okay. back to you, but I've got to try and make some progress here. Tavish. 
Scott, please. Thanks so much. Uh, Secretary of State, I wonder if you could just clarify the thinking on intergovernmental machinery. That was a major recommendation of, of the Smith Agreement, and Linda and I spent many a happy hour um, deliberating on that. But, uh, oh, okay, uh, uh, we discussed it. Uh, um, uh, just in terms of transparency, because the convener's earlier point about uh, Parliament to Parliament, your earlier observations about Parliament to Parliament, a lot of this actually reflects on Parliament scrutiny of joint ministerial committees and that kind of thing. There's frankly none of that at the moment. And uh, I know it's early, but has the UK government, and I'll ask the same question of John Sweeney, has the, has the UK government given some thought yet to, well, to that process? Yeah. I mean, the, uh, this perhaps does tie into to Mark MacDonald's uh, earlier point about those things that you can bring forward earlier. Mm. There's no need for primary legislation to improve the workings between the uh, two governments. Um, you do need a bit of political goodwill, obviously, um, and sometimes you get that, sometimes you don't. Um, but I see no reason why you couldn't uh, improve uh, and uh, strengthen the, the, the joint government working, uh, and that's one of the again one of the things I will want to stop to be talking to uh, Nicholas Sturgeon about. And again, I think your your point, Harish, is uh, on the money. Uh, this should not just be about stitch-ups between uh, governments uh, in, in London and Edinburgh. Uh, you know, the, the, the role of Parliament in scrutinising the joint workings uh, is uh, going to be absolutely fundamental. And I think that you know, there's a job of work to be done there by Parliament, uh, be it here or uh, in the House of Commons. So you'd be open uh, to such uh, ideas as publication of minutes and, and uh, so on and so forth, subject, of course, to agreement of both governments, and indeed Welsh and, and Northern Irish governments, mm -hmm. not just about Scotland and uh, London as well? Uh, I would be open to that sort of suggestion, yeah. uh, with the obvious caveat that experience <laughs> teaches me that when minutes are going to be published, then they tend to be less revealing than they might otherwise be. And I think uh, if we're to be serious about this, then we will need to find uh, more robust mechanisms yeah. and more extensive yeah. mechanisms that, that, than but that. Even, but even Parliament, but both in London and Edinburgh, being told where meetings are would be a start. Uh, that would be. Yeah. Uh, okay. That's the sort of thing that you Thank could you. easily start. Okay, I'm going to do another couple of questions in this area, and then we'll move on to tax. But Rob Gibson, and then I'm going to come to Drew. Thank you, uh, Convener. Good morning, Secretary of State. Uh, in the light of the strengthened uh, Scottish devolution settlement within the United Kingdom, Lord Smith expressed the opinion that Scottish Parliament committees could be strengthened. Uh, do you agree that the powers to compel the attendance of witnesses, which applies in Westminster, should be extended to the Scottish Parliament's committees? Um. In principle, yes. The, the reason that I hesitate slightly here, Rob, is that you invite me into commenting on what is essentially a, a matter for uh, the Scottish Parliament. You know, that really should be for your own uh, standing orders. And, uh, I mean, I think that under Smith, that's the sort of thing that you will have complete control of. And um, as a Scottish citizen... Uh, I, I, or as a, you know, a UK citizen living in, and uh, born and bred in Scotland, um, I, uh, I can see the, 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 the merit in that, but um, it's for you to decide your own procedures. Well, that wasn't decided by us. It was decided for us, mm -hmm. uh, primarily. You know, David Cameron has offered mm -hmm. to meet MSPs in a formal setting in Holyrood. Uh, should other ministers of the UK, if requested, appear before Scottish Parliament committees? Well, that's always something for individual uh, ministers to make the decision for themselves. Um, I've always uh, attended when I've been asked, uh, and I would certainly expect to do so. And if I'm not available, then you know, I have a junior minister who attends in my place. But that really is for um, ministers to decide for themselves. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Drew Smith. Mm -hmm. um, thanks very much, uh, Convener. Good morning, Secretary of State. Um, the, uh, Lord Kelvin um, on Tuesday um, I asked him around this whole issue of um, the public's understanding of the devolution settlement and the extent to which um, the public having a good understanding of the settlement was one of the criteria by which we would have a successful implementation. Um, and he expressed that he was surprised by the lack of public understanding of, of essentially who did what um, in Scotland at the moment. Um, how do you see the UK government um, being involved in taking forward uh, a solution to that concern? Yeah, uh, Lord Smith may have been surprised. I think that maybe reflects the fact that Lord Smith is a businessman and not a politician. Uh, those of us who've spent time on the doorsteps uh, over the years, uh, I'm afraid, have become 
rather wearily resigned uh, to that. Uh, and I don't think you will ever get to a, um, an ideal solution. Um, most people in their lives have better things to, to do than to become intimately acquainted with the constitutional niceties of government. Um, having said that, though, I think that uh, there is a, an opportunity for us all as, as politicians to uh, sort of stick more or less to the area where we have um, legislative or constitutional competence. Uh, I mean, Tavish and I, within our constituency, um, generally, uh, well, Tavish will, will speak on, on matters that are devolved and I will speak on uh, matters that are reserved and we, we not exclusively, occasionally we, 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 we uh, sort of stray, but um, generally it helps if uh, MPs talk about reserved matters and MSPs talk about devolved matters. There might be some scope for a, a public information campaign, especially once we uh, get to uh, a, a, a implementation of the, the new settlement and the Smith proposals. Could I just pressure on that just a, a little bit further, Secretary of State, because I, I accept the point, I think it was a frustration that, that we all understand um, locally, and it was certainly an issue that, that, that was discussed a lot um, in referendum debates where there, there was confusion uh, uh, quite often around um, were we actually talking about a transfer of power or what it, what, was it actually about how the power has been exercised um, at the moment, because um, it seems to me there's maybe a need for, for something more than just the potential of perhaps at some stage a public information um, campaign about it. It, it, it. it is a problem which we as politicians have maybe just come to accept. I, I accept that you don't necessarily envisage that the public are going to be interested in the detail of this, but there is um, a responsibility for both governments to be clear about um, what it is they do. And Lord Smith specifically said, I think on Tuesday, um, that there had been a tendency, and I think he was referring to the UK government and successive UK governments here, um, to devolve and then essentially ignore um, that a power was transferred um, to Scotland and then the UK government um, you know, just simply stepped back. So it's, I suppose it's a question about how active um, uh, essentially the Scotland office uh, is on these issues. It's, sorry, I, um, I see now Sorry, for you were, were, were wanting to take the, the, the question. And yes, I think there's a lot more that can be done uh, by the Scotland office as a uh, the, the voice in the face of the United Kingdom government in Scotland. Uh, and I think that in many ways, uh, after the uh, Scottish Parliament was set up in 1999, uh, the Scottish uh, or the UK government uh, did kind of leave the field uh, in Scotland. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, we didn't do enough to uh, remind people here of the continuing uh, quite substantial uh, responsibilities that, that we have as a government and uh, there's, there's more that now requires to be done in that regard. Uh, one of the things that the referendum campaign brought about was uh, a, a beefing up of the Scotland office operation in terms of stakeholder engagement loosely called and uh, that involved in fact a, a better engagement not just from the Scotland office but from UK uh, government departments across the field and uh, I mean just at my own business board uh, a few weeks ago one of the members there uh, said to me look you know it's been great for the last couple of years we've had people like the permanent secretary uh, to the Department for Transport coming up here and talking to us and engaging with us directly. Uh, promise me that uh, that sort of engagement will continue. And I can give him that uh, promise because uh, I'm determined that it will. Um, and, you know, there's, there's no denying the fact that, uh, that uh, we, we did somewhat, we, I say the, the UK government, uh, in, a, in a previous guise, did somewhat take the, the eye off the ball. No point in getting excited about it now, but we'll do it differently in the future. General issues and of constitutional course. issues there, and we've actually gone into the constitutional stuff a bit earlier than expected. However, um, that's where we are. So we've got about <coughs> 40 minutes left now just to get into the stuff in tax and welfare. Uh, can I just hand over to Lewis MacDonald at this stage? And others who want to get involved in the tax issues, let me know. Thank, thank you very much. And I'm interested, uh, Secretary of State, in your view on the practicalities of the tax devolution agreement, uh, uh, proposals that are agreed uh, by Smith and, and, and how they will be taken forward. How do you envisage that process um, being
being managed in a practical sense uh, in terms of the actual transfer of responsibility and the consequences that might have uh, across the tax uh, revenue raising responsibilities. In, in practical terms, the, the transfer of what happens hereafter, I mean, with what, in terms of what happens hereafter, uh, you'll know it's, it's in the Smith report that HMRC will continue to operate as the tax collecting body for the Scottish and the UK governments in Scotland. Uh, I think that's a sensible uh, and, and uh, workable arrangement, uh, the best practical one. Um, the actual uh, sort of business of the, the, the tax devolution uh, is being led on by the Treasury, self-evidently, and uh, I mean it is going to require a degree of uh, close working. The, these lines of communication, though, are already open, uh, and the, the communication and the, the joint working has been close since uh, the passing of the 2012 Act in relation to the Scottish rate of income tax, which will be coming into force in 2016. And do you, do you think that the continuing collection of the tax on a UK-wide, of income tax particularly on a UK-wide basis, is that in itself a uh, protection against the risk of damaging tax competition of people uh, disguising their domicile or disguising their place of work in order to benefit from a lower rate of tax? Yeah. Um, the, the, uh, the, 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 the basis on which the uh, tax collection will be done, I think, is residence rather than, than domicile. So forgive me for being a picky lawyer for a second. It's old habits die hard. Uh, but I think it's, it's, it's an important point. Um, and uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the use of the HMRC, um, yes, I would hope that that would uh, eliminate uh, any uh, opportunity for uh, sort of tax avoidance by uh, stipulating your residence as being in one place or another. You can't discount the possibility that there will always be people who will want to play the system in that regard. But uh, I think that the continuation of the HMRC as, as the single UK-wide collecting body is the best guard that there can be for the overall integrity of the system. Thanks very much. Um, Mark MacDonald and then Stuart McMillan. Mine, mine moves on to VAT conveners. I don't know if you want to take those who want to cover income tax or. Oh, does anybody else want to go into the income tax areas? And Rob, okay, Rob, we'll do that that way. Good um, point. Thank you. Uh, Secretary of State, the devolution of income tax doesn't devolve the person allowance. Why is that? Because the income tax re uh, continues to be a shared tax, you would have to ask uh, the Smith Commission, I guess, why they, they reached the decision that they did. Um, I can see good reasons for it. Uh, of course, it is also open to uh, the Scottish Government post-devolution um, to use the creation of a zero-rate band if they chose to, to uh, vary the, uh, the, the the, the, uh, the personal allowance effectively uh, upwards. The only end that would be achieved, I think, by devolving the personal allowance or the setting of the personal allowance would be to allow the government here to, to, uh, to, to cut the personal allowance effectively to increase taxes. But, you know, the um, Scottish Government could set a zero rate in the top personal allowance if they wanted, so why not just transfer the personal allowance? I'm, so, I'm sorry, Mr Gibson, I didn't quite catch that. Well, if we could set a zero rate you know, above the personal allowance. Why not just transfer the personal allowance? Well, because uh, the income tax remains, as I say, a, a shared uh, tax. And, uh, you know, this is one aspect of, of the uh, tax that the Smith Commission decided uh, and all parties agreed uh, should be uh, reserved. Um, and uh, there are others, you know, the, the, uh, the taxation of, of savings and dividends income, for example, is also to remain reserved. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, unless you're wanting to cut the personal tax allowance, if that's maybe what you've got in mind, is it? Not what I've got in mind, but, no. you know, the personal allowance interacts mm -hmm. with the welfare system, doesn't it? Uh, what would happen to someone's un point. Yeah. universal credit or benefit entitlement if the Scottish Government sets a zero rate higher than the UK 
meaning that they get to keep uh, more of their income. Uh, would the UK reduce its universal credit or the working tax credits? That, that's the sort of detail that still have to be out the, ironed out between the two governments. And and it's uh, pretty clear from Smith that there's a lot of that sort of work to be done, yeah. Okay, we'll look forward to it being done. But, you know, but what government would get the benefits of that saving? Would that be transferred to the Scottish Government? The same answer. Um, I said Mark McDonald would be next. Yeah, th thank you, Convener. Uh, obviously, control of VAT will remain at uh, UK level, but there will be an assignment of revenue to Scotland at the first, the first 10 pence, um, which at the <coughs> moment is 50%, but who knows what the, what the future holds. Um, if the UK government were to take a decision in the future to lower VAT on a specific sector um, below that 10p threshold that's been done in other areas, um, would there, what, would, what, what would be the consequential impact on, on, on the Scottish government's budget and would there be advanced negotiation given that there would be that impact or would it be that the Scottish government would find out about it when it was announced by the Chancellor in the budget? Well, I think this is a good example of the sort of joint working uh, arrangements that we're going to have and it's, it, it illustrates the imperative of having a more uh, robust um, a, and effective mechanism for uh, the, for, for regulating the business between the two governments. Um, we've managed to get through with what we've had hitherto because the areas of, of overlap have been less pronounced than they are going to be. So uh, in the future, that would clearly, in my view, require to be something in which there was, was consultation between the two governments. Okay. And, mm. and that consultation would work in, in more ways than just the UK government saying to the Scottish government, we propose to do this on VAT, the Scottish Government would be open to make approaches to the UK Government on, on approaches to yeah. take on VAT as that's, well. That's the, the whole point of it being a shared tax. Can I ask a question about tax? Because something came up with Lord Smith about VAT as well, um, Secretary of State, because in evidence to the committee on Tuesday, the head of the Smith Commission, Secretary Jenny Bates, um, stated that if, the, if VAT revenues increase due to increased economic activity, then the Scottish Government will keep these increased revenues and vice versa. Vice versa. Just for the record, to someone to me, because I, I wasn't when, when she gave me that answer, I was, a, I was a slightly surprised because we're talking about assigned budgets. Is that your understanding as well? It, sorry, that if you have more VAT coming in from from yeah. VAT peers in Scotland, then you will get half of that. Yes, that's my understanding. That's that's helpful just to get that mm. clarified. Stuart Mill and then Tavish Scott. Good morning, Secretary of State. Um, <clears throat> so on page uh, nine uh, of the, the Smith Commission report, uh, there are seven <laughs> principles there. Uh, and uh, principles four, five and six, uh, I believe, are, are extremely important, particularly on the issue of taxation. And certainly not the standing uh, four, five and six. Um, what are your thoughts on the Smith Commission recommendations to keep corporation tax reserved whilst uh, only yesterday the Chancellor announced that uh, corporation tax is to be devolved to Northern Ireland? Well, it's um, subject, obviously, to the very important provisos that uh, there will be uh, progress made in the Northern Ireland uh, budget being set and also that uh, you know, there are implications for this in the, in the peace process. Um, and, uh, you, you know, I think you heard Lord Smith on this say that this was not something that uh, he thought would be of benefit to Scotland. Um, certainly it was the, uh, the, the, the submissions that uh, Smith got from the business organisations and from the trade unions was very, were very much in line with that view. And uh, if that happens, and uh, I, I stress the if at this time, it's a recognition of the fact that Northern Ireland stands in a very different position from the rest of the United Kingdom for reasons that are um, historic and, you know, largely not very happy ones. Uh, you know, uh, the, the if that happens, it will be a recognition of the, the recent and troubled past of, of Northern Ireland. I, th I certainly accept that, uh, that the Northern Irish situation, uh, because of the, the past, is somewhat different from the situation that we have. Um, but certainly in your own submission to the Smith Commission, I mean, uh, I mean you do recommend that corporation tax also should be operated and collected at the UK level. 
Um, but that, obviously, with what's going to happen to Northern Ireland, certainly is in contradiction to your own submission to Smith for the situation for Scotland. Sorry, see my own submission to Smith. Uh, You're talking about the Campbell Commission or no, the, the, Democrats the Liberal Democrats submission. to the Smith Commission? Yeah. I, the, the, I mean, I don't know what I can really add to the fact that uh, there are particular circumstances in Northern Ireland having a land border with the rest of, of uh, the, the island of Ireland uh, and uh, a very particular set of economic circumstances that come from its very troubled past. Uh, and that if the judgment of the government is that uh, this will be uh, a necessary part of uh, stabilising that constitutional settlement, I don't think many people in Scotland would want to interfere with that. I just wonder, Secretary of State, how relevant really a land border is, given that obviously there are a great many firms in Scotland do you know, export, import work between Scotland and the Republic of Ireland. I think and, and, in, in across the a very narrow strip of water. So yeah. it's, uh, I mean, it, it's it, it's relevant uh, in as much as that is the, the, the it, that has a much greater impact on on the business and commercial activity in Northern Ireland. Um, a, a very different impact from the impact that it has on trade with uh, England, Scotland, and Wales. Um. David Scott. Thank you. Uh, convener, can I just can I take um, the Secretary of State to uh, powers 32 onwards of, of the Smith Agreement on the Crown Estate? And I just wonder, this is, uh, I know it's early and it's only week in, but uh, how the UK Government plan to give effect to those paragraphs, and notably the one on, on 33, which uh, we might have a, a particular interest <coughs> in with regard to the islands? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, look, uh, I think the committee will know. Uh, my views on reform of the Crown Estate uh, since I became Secretary of State. I've referred to it on a number of occasions as being unfinished business and uh, I think this uh, part of the Smith Agreement uh, allows us to go ahead and to finish that business. Um, I, I was particularly uh, interested in the, uh, the further, the onward devolution to the island groups in particular. That's something which uh, the Three Islands Councils have been pursuing as part of the Our Islands, Our Future uh, campaign. And, uh, I, you know, I, I think that there is a real opportunity for the uh, island communities there to, to move on. Um, it says areas such as Orkney, uh, Shetland and, and the Western Isles. Um, on my construction, that would mean uh, areas that have island or coastal uh, communities. And uh, again, this is something which I think could profitably be discussed uh, between the two governments. But uh, I would also want to be talking to the local authorities themselves. Uh, you know, to come back to Mark McDonald's point about uh, early engagement um, and, you know, what can you do early? Well, in fact, looking at how you would just, uh, how you would affect the transfer to the, uh, the island communities is something that can start now. Mm. Uh, I have a, a framework for uh, engagement with the islands councils. Um, a working group which uh, is next due to meet in January. Uh, I would want to be talking to them about it and indeed I'm open to uh, discussions between ourselves, the Scottish Government and the local authorities themselves even at this stage. If there is a, a neater way of getting transfer of power direct from Westminster to the coastal and island communities uh, of Scotland that want it, then uh, I don't see any reason why we wouldn't, uh, if all three parties can agree, do that. Okay. Thank you. And just on paragraph 34, which was the other, uh, I think, main uh, uh, requirement here, which is, again, a memorandum of understanding between the UK and Scottish governments in respect of the wider interests the UK, the oil and gas industry particularly exercised by this. Uh, again, do you see that coming through as part of the overall package you talked about in your earlier remarks um, as part of a package? Or, again, do you think that that particular paragraph could be given effect much more quickly in terms of uh, working between the governments? Yeah, I, I would see it a, a, as being an essential yeah. um, prerequisite, actually. Um, and a, it, again, it highlights, in fact, 
the, the way in which Smith offers us the opportunity to strengthen the workings of Scotland's two governments. Um, at a Scottish level and, and at a United Kingdom level uh, because it, it creates a greater imperative uh, for, for a, a joint, a genuine joint uh, working relationship. Thank Rob, you. a very brief supplementary if you, if, if you will, and then I'll come on to Alison Jones. I, I'm curious, Secretary of State, to know if uh, the local authorities uh, would share in uh, the Crown Estate's seabed out to the 200 mile limit as well as urban assets, etc., and if the coastal communities and the island authorities would actually benefit from these. The, coast, the, the Crown Estate ownership of the seabed goes out to 12 miles, I believe. I don't think it goes out to the 200 mile limit. Okay. Alison Jones. Um, thank you, Convener. Um, the devolution of the Crown Estate's economic assets to local communities is, uh, is warmly welcomed. It's a subject that's been uh, discussed uh, far and wide. But do you think there, that this should be the beginning of a process to see local communities empowered more generally? I mean, for example, I, I believe it's the case that Angela Merkel could not freeze council tax um, it, in the way that the Scottish Government is able to do so, you know, to impose that on local authorities. Um, do you think that there has been such a fixation with powers devolved to the Scottish Parliament that perhaps opportunities have been missed to genuinely devolve greater powers to local authorities? Uh, sadly, that's the case, I think. That's certainly my experience, uh, you know, living in, and working in Orkney and, and representing Orkney and Shetland. Um, and uh, Lord Smith does actually make reference to this and the way in which this did come out with a whole range of the representations that he received when he was taking evidence. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's in the nature sometimes of government to, to centralise control. So it does require a determined political effort to ensure that a localism agenda is actually driven through. Um, uh, you know, I'm uh, completely committed to that agenda. Um, that's why I was delighted, for example, that w the UK government, the Scottish government and Glasgow City Council and other West Coast local authorities were able to agree the city deal uh, for Glasgow. City deals have been a, a, a good mechanism in other parts of the United Kingdom for uh, you know, promoting that uh, agenda of localism. Um, it, it does come down though to a, a pretty fundamental point that we can sit and we can talk about the, uh, the, the, the location of power and, and the structures of government and all the rest of it, but ultimately what matters, what will be felt in our communities and by the people that we represent, it is how these powers are used, not who is using them. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to have to move on to the welfare area now, folks, and uh, I'll come to Linda Fabian in a moment. But there was one question I had myself, Secretary of State, because I, I was concerned about the interplay between reserve benefits, the benefits that will come to Scotland through the extended devolution package, and universal um, credit. So I went and I asked Spice to look at it, and I've circulated that paper around this morning that I got back from Spice. Seen that? I'm sorry. Uh, well, I apologise. You've not seen that. But yeah. I, I can tell you roughly what it says. Uh, the, um, it states that if the Scottish Parliament were to top up reserve benefits, then a recipient of universal credit would receive a corresponding reduction in the universal credit payment. Now that surprised me, um, and therefore I just wonder. I mean, you're, you're, it's maybe too technical a question at this stage, but I think it's something that needs to be explored because obviously uh, by extension, that would probably mean the same to the devolved powers then in these circumstances. Yeah, well, I mean, it would be helpful if you could let me have that briefing because I've not seen it and I, I mean, I don't, I struggle off the top of my head to think of anything in Smith mm -hmm. that would justify an assertion of that sort uh, and I can't think of any first principle that would apply that would mean that it yeah. should so, um, if you let me have that briefing, I will write to you. I will uh, make the necessary inquiry with uh, colleagues in, in Whitehall. Thank you. The, the, the reason I ask it is because when you actually look at what the Smith Commission report actually says at paragraph 55, 
Any new benefits or discretionary payments introduced by the Scottish Parliament must provide additional income for a recipient, not result in automatic offsettings. So it doesn't actually talk about the top-up process or the devolved power. So I think we need a bit of clarity around that area. Otherwise, what would be the point of having the, exactly. the, the powers yes. or to, to do that? I, I mean, mean, it's quite it, a fundamental it, point. It, I, I would, without hearing the reasoning behind that uh, conclusion, I couldn't really offer you any explanation for it. It doesn't make sense to me, but um, the, the, it may be that our old friend, the law of unintended consequences, is at play here. And if that is the case, then all the more reason that uh, we have proper scrutiny of, of the draft clauses when they're coming forward. Okay, thank you very much. Linda. Uh, thank you very much, Convener. Uh, good morning, Secretary of State. Uh, Convener, I'd like to first of all um, have a wee dig at something the Secretary of State said earlier and clarify it for the record. Um, I, I think, Secretary of State, you, you, you actually said about the personal allowance, all parties agreed, giving the impression that that was a starting point for everyone. I'd just like to put it on the record that a recommendation in the Smith report doesn't mean that everyone agreed with the proposition itself or that it was, in fact, the best solution. Uh, we had discussion, we reached compromises and made agreement on what could be included in the report. So it's a very different thing. Thanks very much. Um, in relation to the substance of what I want to ask, one of the things that everyone, I think, and Tavish will correct me if I'm wrong, no doubt, <laughs> agreed upon, as, as did Civic Scotland in their submissions, was that the work programme wasn't working particularly well for Scotland. Um, quite a bit of confusion and that, in fact, um, if we had control over the work programme to meet our specific circumstances, we could use it much more effectively. Uh, I was quite um, disheartened to hear that the UK government had signed extensions to the current work programme contractors. And I just wonder if you could um, outline for us what that actually means in terms of powers transferred for the work programme how it will come over to us and whether, in fact, Scotland will have to stick with uh, the UK government's methodology and just administer it and for how long that would be the case. Right. Um, well, I've seen some of the, the coverage on this and I saw the yeah. letter uh, last night from Secretary of State for Working Pensions to uh, Rosanna Cunningham. Um, first of all, I think it's important to put out front and centre this was a decision that was taken in August. So some of this breathless commentary about uh, this being uh, a dreadful uh, decision that was uh, designed to, um, you know, thwart the will of the, wish the Smith Commission uh, is not uh, justified because, uh, frankly, this decision was taken long before uh, the uh, Smith Commission was even set up. Now. Um, Come back to the earlier point when we were discussing the uh, procedures that follow here. Um, you will have a bill which, as I said to you, will clear the House of Commons and House of Lords by late uh, 2015, early 2016. It would need constitutionally uh, to be finished by March, I think, at the latest. Um, that then takes you into the spring of 2016. So uh, in practical terms, um, what would be achieved in terms of, of new systems and designs and the point at which they could administratively as well as legislatively be dissolved, I, I think remains still to be seen. So what I would say is that although these, uh, these contracts have been extended to 20, from 2016 to 17. Um, this again is an area where the two governments should be sitting down uh, and you know the Scottish government should be saying to the UK government we have done some thinking on this uh, this is what we want to do with our new welfare system now how can that be represented uh, with the contractual arrangements that you're putting in place with political will there, there's no reason why that that can't actually be done so you're saying what you've signed up to takes it to 2017? Takes it to 2017, yeah. Spring? That's what I, as I understand it, yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I do have something slightly related, uh, if I carry on. Yeah, one of the things that hasn't been raised so far is a, an extra part 
of the Commission report, which was about additional policy matters that there weren't firm recommendations put in on. Um, student visas um, and some, some welfare issues like trafficking, asylum, uh, other matters such as red meat and uh, fisheries levies. Um, I just wondered if you had a view on whether, in fact, these um, additional policy matters would be considered seriously in the same time scale as the package that you mentioned earlier, or whether, indeed, there are issues in there that could be dealt with very quickly, um, because you know, many of them don't actually need that legislation. Um, I, I mean, this is an interesting part, and as you say, it, it comes right at the end. Um, I think that a, well, I mean, Lord Smith w was given a remit. Uh, he set his own principles. We, you know, we've referred to them uh, already this morning. And um, what he's come up with was something which reflects uh, further, a need for further devolution uh, in those areas where it makes sense because there is a distinctive Scottish need. Um, I look at this list and uh, some of it just looks like issues where people might not like the policy of the existing UK government rather than something where there is a distinctive Scottish need. On the other hand, though, um, being able to lodge from within Scotland an, a, a, an asylum claim to the Home Office, uh, I don't see any reason why with a, a bit of a political goodwill and a, 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 a attention, that sort of thing couldn't a, be, be accommodated. That's administrative. You don't need to pass a, a, a law for, for that. Could rather than having people traipsing yeah. down to, to Croydon. Just in closing then, could I just suggest that student visas was something that we discussed very, very seriously and has a very, very distinctive um, Scottish element to it. And I, I don't think there's anybody would complain if you were to say, as a matter of goodwill today, that you would take that very seriously. I'll well, certainly take that seriously. I mean, I, I know the issues. I talk to the universities yeah. themselves. And uh, it, it's... You know, it, it, it's a concern across the whole of the United Kingdom. It's not exclusive to Scotland. I've got a quick supplementaries. I'm told they're quick, so there'll need, there'll need to be because I want to get into the last. I'll bit. try and be quick with my answer. Sir. So, Drew uh, Tavish and then Alec Johnson. Um, uh, thanks, convener. I hope to raise the same points. I'm grateful to, to Linda for doing it and, and allowing us the, the, the chance to. Um, I, I think these are important issues that, that Lord Smith has put at, at the end of his report that do need some resolution. I think we need some reassurance that, although they're outside um, the formal agreement, that doesn't mean that they're you know, just simply put back on the shelf. Um, and you talked about uh, you know, where there is a difference. Uh, I mean, health and safety, I would have to say to you, Secretary of State, we do have an anomaly in Scotland, um, and we do have an interaction between um, health and safety legislation and prosecution services, uh, and indeed uh, the promotion of health in the workplace through other devolved areas. That, that there are big issues in here, and I wonder if you could undertake um, certainly to discuss those issues further with the stakeholders that are concerned about them, particularly uh, the STC, but indeed, of course, business would want to be uh, involved in those discussions. Because my concern would be that the, the barrier um, to progress on that issue is perhaps that the expertise comes um, from the HSE uh, that we have at the moment, which clearly has a, an, an interest in continuing uh, the, the status quo. And there needs to be a wider discussion around some of those issues, and, and as Linda says, that it, it, it isn't put on the, the back burner. Yeah, well, I mean, just to take the, the point you make about HSE and, and having a different prosecution regime, uh, I, that's something I know from my own professional uh, background, having both prosecuted and defended HSE cases uh, over uh, many years. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that was always a, a concern that there was not that understanding across the whole of the HSE that, that different considerations applied you to different criminal justice system and the role of the procurator's fiscal uh, was, was very different uh, in terms of bringing prosecutions forward. Uh, having said that, though, it, it, it worked more often than it, it, it didn't. It nearly always worked. Very rarely did prosecutions fail because of uh, these sort of uh, uh, minor uh, tensions. Um, uh, I still think, though, that the, the, you know, notwithstanding the interaction between inspection and prosecution, there's a obvious UK interest uh, in having a uniform system of, of inspection and regulation across the country. Um, I mean, all these issues 
um, are ones where there is clearly work to be done between the two governments, and again, I come back to it, between the two parliaments as well. And, uh, you know, if, if, oh, if distinctive arrangements are to be made, yeah. they'll, we'll make it by building consensus. Yeah. Top. Okay. Tavish, and we're not going through this as quick as I need to, because I'm not getting through everybody. Tavish and then Alec Johnson. Thank you, Kavita. On Linda Fabian's first point about the work programme, which I agree with, if I understood your answer to Linda Fabian correctly, um, Secretary of State, you were saying that, uh, subject to the government's working together, there's a way to get that to happen more quickly. It doesn't need to wait until 2017. I think Linda asked a very fair question, which I agree with. But um, if, governments, if the Scottish Government come up, can come up with a programme of employability, then it can happen more quickly. Is that what you were saying? That's, that's where the conversation needs to be had. Thank you. Alec? Yes, the, back on the subject of welfare, uh, having arrived here this morning after three years in the Welfare Reform Committee, uh, I've seen the, the process of divergence which has happened in relation to welfare in Scotland already, uh, and the proposals under the Smith Commission open that up quite significantly. Now, there's been a, a determination to cling to the Barnett formula, a, almost a white-knuckled death grip in some cases. Uh, but as we... <laughs> As we go towards uh, the, the proposals contained uh, per, uh, in the Smith Commission, particularly in relation to working age benefits, uh, there is uh, a significant divergence in policy already where there is a south of the border uh, a, a policy of reducing dependency of uh, demand reduction in order to limit cost, whereas the, there is a, a priority to do something different, rather the opposite in Scotland. As we move forward with this, are we not heading towards a Barnet formula elephant trap uh, where the amount of money allocated uh, in UK budgets for uh, working age benefits in particular will fall away while Scotland may simply pile on demand uh, and find itself underfunded? Well, I mean, that's the, 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 the beauty of devolution, isn't it? You know, you, you make your spending decisions and now you, you're going to have to account for that in your, your uh, funding decisions as well. Um, and you can only spend the money once. If we've learned nothing else in the last 10 years, we should surely have learned that. Now, um, Stuart McMillan. Um, <coughs> a question just regarding the, the DLA and PIPs, but just before I go into that, just in terms of the, the work programme, was Lord Smith made aware of the extension uh, when he was going through the process? I don't know. No. Okay. Thank you. Uh, just in terms of the, so going back to about the other question, um, it was under paragraph 49. Uh, of the Smith report, uh, obviously the, the, the DLA and PIP is to be devolved. But obviously with the transition from DLA to PIP uh, being delayed, um, it's reasonable to request a, a halt to the rollout uh, so that it doesn't actually create any difficulties uh, to Scotland. And is this something that, uh, that you would agree with? No, I don't. Um, I mean, look, you saw yesterday, for example, instances where there were changes made to taxes, stamp duty land tax for in, for in particular. Um, you know, that's going to um, continue across the, the whole of the United Kingdom until uh, stamp duty is uh, devolved then formally at the beginning of the next financial year. Um, the... the, the uh, the, 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 the rollout across the United Kingdom will, will, will have to continue across the United Kingdom. If, however, as I keep coming back to saying, the uh, Scottish Government, uh, as they emerge with a, a, a welfare policy, because uh, you know, not liking change is not just the same as having a, a welfare pol policy, um, they should be talking to the Department for Work and Pensions and making sure that when uh, devolution of these elements comes, that it is something that can be done uh, properly and sensibly and smoothly. But certainly, it's, uh, with, the, uh, with the, the UK government's target of uh, reducing uh, the, the expenditure by 20%, <laughs> uh, and that potentially having a, a negative effect in Scotland, uh, to people in Scotland of some £310 million, pounds, then, uh, then surely if there's going to be this uh, this uh, uh, devolution of the power to Scotland, then it would actually be worthwhile uh, to, uh, to actually have that consideration of ceasing the rollout so that, uh, that there is that uh, better uh, implementation process in Scotland. No, what I'm saying to you is that if you have a policy for doing it differently, then you should be talking to the uh, Department for Work and Pension about that, pensions about that now. I I'm not seeing that policy coming forward. Okay. Well, I'm sure it's certain uh, that uh, the Scottish Government 
uh, would certainly welcome uh, the opportunity to actually have those discussions uh, with the UK government uh, if, uh, if, that, if that opportunity actually is there. I think if your committee wants to take a, any message from t this morning's session, convener, you might take the message that I am an enthusiast for improved communication between uh, uh, Holyrood and, and uh, Whitehall in these matters. Who do you want us to start? <laughs> <laughs> Goodwill. Uh, on the subject of welfare, earlier on corporation tax, you mentioned submissions to the Smith Commission and the fact that they had directed the approach that was to be taken. On welfare, there was almost universal support from Civic Scotland for a much more radical transfer of welfare powers than that which is contained within the Smith Commission. Um, Ma various news outlets, including Gary Gibbon, the Channel 4 News political editor, who himself says um, at Tuesday's Cabinet when Alistair Carmichael read out the plans taking shape at the Smith Commission table, one after another English Tory Cabinet ministers challenged the plans and their implications for their brief in their department. And he says that Ian Duncan Smith was the sharpest critic of what was being cooked up in Scotland, fearing his entire universal credit fabric was being unravelled. Is that an accurate representation of events? No. Oh. No? Okay. Um, in that case, um, did the UK government have any input uh, in relation to the welfare proposals that were being drafted at the Smith Commission? We were asked and, and we provided um, uh, briefing and, and information for the, the Commission on a number of occasions. Yes, I believe so. Okay. Uh, in terms of the input then of Civic Scotland and obviously their comments in the aftermath, do you take the view that the recommendations in the Smith Commission report are a floor or a ceiling? I'm sorry, what do you mean there, there have been calls uh, from many in Civic Scotland who feel underwhelmed by some of the welfare powers that are being proposed and would like to see some of them perhaps being uh, revised or, or advanced further post the Smith Commission report. Is it your view that the recommendations of Smith are a floor or a ceiling? I don't think that's a, a sensible uh, way to proceed in terms of the implementation. They're substantial. It's between two and a half and three billion pounds of welfare power. You can do a lot of good with that sort of money uh, if, you, if, you take your, if you concentrate your mind on it. I've, as I said already, I have a stakeholder group uh, which is being formed. I would expect that, uh, in fact, I know that Citizens Advice Scotland, for example, are very keen to be part of that, uh, and I will work with them and anybody else. Two more, and then we'll have to draw this to conclusion. I've got Bill Kidd and then Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much, uh, Convener. Thank you, Minister. Um, <clears throat> you said earlier that you can't spend the money twice, and um, I think that's, uh, that's a truism. Um, however, the uh, Smith Commission, according to most, uh, most commentators, was supposed to provide a sufficient range of powers to provide the Scottish Government with the financial means to create new benefits in areas of devolved responsibility. <clears throat> Do you, or can you tell us, um, with the new powers over taxation um, and other areas uh, which the Scottish Government is to, is to deliver on, whether that money uh, which may be raised in those ways will be balanced out by a reduction in the Barnett formula, which would mean that there's greater need to deliver on um, powers, but there's no greater um, financial base with which to do so. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't quite understand the premise behind your question. It seems to me that you, you have an adjustment to the Barnett formula because mm -hmm. you're taking money directly and if you want then to provide uh, benefits of a different nature on a different level uh, than the rest of the United Kingdom, then that's a spending decision for which you now have a, a consequential um, taxation decision. Yes, we have a consequential um, taxation decision to make, um, but in the end result, there will be no greater um, there will be no greater budget for the Scottish Parliament to operate with or the Scottish Government to operate with. But well, well there um, is if you choose to create one. That's the whole point of having tax raising power, surely. Well, <laughs> what about the reduction? That, uh, the question I thought was fairly straightforward is the but is the reduction in the Barnett formula to balance out these taxation? No, uh, there's no reduction in the Barnett formula. It's an adjustment to recognise the fact that we take uh, some taxes directly in Scotland instead of them coming through the Treasury. So it's a reduction then. Thank you. So what part of there is no reduction was, was difficult? 
the post-study entitlement for international students to remain for two years in, uh, because of employment was initially introduced in Scotland as the Fresh Talent Initiative, rolled out across the United Kingdom then uh, it ceased to exist. Given, given what the Smith Agreement says about this is something that's worthy of future consideration, is this something the Scottish Government have raised with the Scotland Office since the abolition of the UK-wide entitlement, or is it something that the, that the UK Government could open discussions with the Scottish Government about? Uh, you mean the creation of a, a of new a fresh, fresh yeah. talent yeah. equivalent or whatever? Um, certainly not in my time. I'm not aware of a direct approach of that sort. I mean, certainly the, the government has raised uh, concerns in, on a number. The Scottish government have raised uh, concerns uh, on a number of occasions with us about that. Um, but in terms of bringing forward a direct proposal, to be honest, Lewis, it's not the sort of thing that uh, there's been an awful lot of in the last couple of years in the run-up to the referendum. Um, who knows? It's quite possible we might be into different water now. But the Smith Agreement now allows for consideration of that between the governments, and if, if the Scottish Government was to make such a suggestion, is it one that you anticipate you would Well, I mean, it was something that we were able to uh, work through in the past uh, with the, the previous administrations uh, in both Edinburgh and London. Um, you have to make the case for it. I mean, and let's not uh, be, uh, you know, let, let's not forget that although the Fresh Talent Initiative did work, it did bring with it uh, a number of, of uh, issues and uh, uh, some challenges. Thank you very much. OK, Secretary State, thank you very much. Um, that's been quite a full session we've had this morning. There may be some things that members will want to raise with us afterwards that we might follow up in writing with you. I'll make sure you get... Give me that, that briefing. Space, we will try and get you the, the fullest possible answer for you. OK, well, thank you very much. Very grateful. Thank you very much for your time. <coughs> Spend for five minutes to change Mrs. Round, please.
Okay, colleagues, um, we'll recommence the evidence taking session this morning, and uh, I very much wor warmly welcome John Swinney, MSP, who is the Deputy First Minister, uh, and his officials to the meeting, um, who are Gerald Byrne, who is the Elections and Constitution Division, and Sean Neill, who is from the Fisca Fiscal Responsibility Division of the Scottish Government. Mr Swinney, would you like to make any opening statement, or would you want to go straight to questions? I'd quite happy to go to questions, Kavir. Okay, can I just open up with a general question to... Yourself, I know you. Because I know you've made comment in, in the chamber, um, Deputy First Minister, the extent to which the Smith Commission recommendations provided sufficient revenue raising and employment creation powers to provide the Scottish Government with enough policy discretion to tackle the socio-economic challenges of Scotland. What would you say about the Smith Commission proposals in that regard, uh, and did they fulfil the vow in that way? I think at the outset, Kavira, I'd, I'd want to reiterate what I said in the Parliamentary Chamber, um, well, what I said in the National Museum last Thursday, what I said in the Parliamentary Chamber on Tuesday, which was that uh, I welcome the contents of the Smith Commission recommendations. Um, I think they represent the acquisition of new powers to the Scottish Parliament, and in that respect, they are welcome to, to me and to the Scottish Government. Uh, I, I think I, uh, you know, the committee will not be surprised to hear me say that uh, the Smith Commission does not deliver everything that I want on the constitutional agenda, and particularly on the issue that you raised with me, convener, about the extent of powers to create further economic opportunity in Scotland to deliver the type of um, flexibility that I think is required to strengthen economic performance in Scotland. I don't believe the Smith Commission provided the necessary powers to enable us to do that. Um, what powers it has provided, the Scottish Government has committed itself, and I reaffirm that point today, to utilise those powers effectively in the interests of people in Scotland. But uh, I don't think that the type of influence that members of the public would have hoped to have come out of the Smith Commission um, has been realised as a consequence of its decisions. Thank you. Where do you think it would have been relatively simple for them to have gone further in terms of their recommendations that would have helped you with job creating powers? I think there could have been movement on uh, issues such as employers' national insurance contributions, the power to control and to vary employers' national insurance contributions, which are seen by employers as a crucial um, factor in uh, determining the cost of employment and therefore the ability to recruit additional staff. Um, secondly, I think the ability to exercise some discretion over um, uh, research and development tax uh, credits to encourage investment in the, by the private sector and one of the recurring pieces of analysis over Scottish economic history over the last 25-30 years has been the relatively poorer performance on private sector research and development that we've experienced in our economy and I think we have to do something distinctive to, uh, to improve that. Uh, obviously another uh, element of how that could be taken forward is powers over corporation tax which obviously have been a long-standing uh, position of the Scottish Government and our belief that uh, these, um, uh, these issues could be uh, could have uh, delivered for the Scottish Government a greater uh, degree of flexibility to enhance and to improve economic performance. Uh, thank you, Deputy First Minister. Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much and good morning. Uh, the, the points you've made uh, this morning, I think, do reflect what you said in the Chamber, but you would accept the fundamental point that the Smith Agreement is an agreement uh, and it's one that you have signed on behalf of your party and of the Scottish Government, and that by doing so, you accept that it is a coherent, logical and welcome package of powers, even if it's not quite the package that you yourself would have designed. Well, I I, if, if, I, if I work my way through all the descriptors in Mr. <laughs> MacDonald's question, <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me take them one by one. I, I, I'm, I certainly think there are welcome new powers, uh, there are additional powers, I, I, I'd have to part company with Mr Macdonald on the question of coherence. I think the powers could have been, if I, my answer to Mr Crawford essentially made my point about coherence, that I think there are, uh, or one of the points I would make about coherence, I think the agreement could have been more coherent because I think there could have been more complete job creating powers that would enable us to strengthen the tax base of Scotland. Why does that matter? That matters because it would create the opportunities to generate the revenues in Scotland that would enable us to take forward some of the other measures that are in the Smith Commission, particularly on the question of welfare, because as I made the point in my uh, parliamentary statement and in response to questions on Tuesday, 
um, if we want to extend the, uh, the, the welfare arrangements in Scotland, we have to have some means of paying for it, and therefore economic expansion and growth in the tax revenue base is um, a fundamental consideration in that respect. I, I, and then finally, on, on the question of coherence, uh, I think much greater scope and, and, and uh, responsibility could have been devolved uh, around the area of welfare, which would have enabled us to establish much better interaction between the welfare system and the tax system, which for me is an absolutely crucial point in how individuals make their journey into employability. Now, those are some of my observations, but uh, Mr Macdonald is absolutely correct to characterise this as an agreement to which um, the Scottish National Party uh, and I are, are party, um, that I endorse its contents, I will work in good faith to implement its contents, um, but I do think there are significant limitations in the agreement and significant constraints that will, um, th that will mean that we will achieve less as a consequence of the terms of the agreement than would have been the case if we'd had more responsibilities. I very much, very much welcome what you say about endorsement and about approaching the matter with goodwill. I think that's critical. Can I finally ask what you would say to members of your own party who appear uh, to treat the agreement with contempt and not to show the goodwill that you have uh, indicated this morning? Well, I, I, I presume Mr Macdonald is um, referring to the incidents in, uh, in Paisley earlier on this week and I, I just simply say that um, I do not believe that was in any way an appropriate or justifiable um, way to act and I think my party has, uh, has dealt with the issue in an appropriate way. Mark Macdonald. Thank you. Camille. It falls within the, the, the area around um, the coherence and um, Deputy First Minister, you've outlined some of the areas that you would have liked to have seen going further. Uh, just before you came to give evidence, the Secretary of State appeared to indicate that he viewed the Smith proposals as being uh, a floor rather than a ceiling and said he was open to input on ways in which perhaps improvement could be made. Would that, would, would that open up, do you think, the opportunity for further constructive discussion as the clauses are drafted and potential new powers come to this Parliament? Well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm all for constructive discussion, as I have demonstrated over the last few weeks to a number of people around the table. <laughs> so uh, I, I think if there's... Uh, I think, uh, one of the points I made in my statement on Tuesday is that I think the implementation of the Smith Commission recommendations would be enhanced if we had... Um, if we had joint working on the design and drafting of the clauses so we could turn the Smith Commission recommendations um, into practice in, a, 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 in an efficient and in a transparent fashion uh, so that um, we are all clear about the details that are involved and uh, I, I certainly uh, commit myself and the Scottish Government to, to work in that fashion to try to secure that necessary progress. You, you've outlined um, uh, a number of areas where there could be early transfer of power because legislation is not required um, and um, we explored that earlier with the Secretary of State. He appeared to rule out anything beyond votes at 16 being delivered outside of what he referred to as a package. Is that something that, that you would want to see further discussion on? Are there powers that you think beyond the votes at 16, which obviously we want to have in place to allow 16 and 17 year olds to vote in 2016, um, are there other powers which you would like to see being transferred early in order that, that the Scottish Government could make effect of them and effectively it could be seen as a down payment on future powers? I think essentially I come from the point of view that the sooner we got on with this, the better. Um, I, I take Mr Macdonald's point, this is an agreement so we should get on with implementing the agreement as, as swiftly and as timorously as we can. Uh, I'm reminded that during the, um, the referendum campaign, uh, the former Prime Minister, Gordon Brown, said that the, uh, the, the additional powers that would be offered by the three um, UK parties would be delivered quicker than Scottish independence. And Scottish independence was to be delivered by March 2016. So that's quite, a, it's quite an urgent and pressing timetable. So I'm, I'm certainly um, very committed to um, working to the timetable set out by the former Prime Minister 
who made such a decisive contribution and has made a decisive contribution to Scottish politics, and I pay warm tribute to him uh, here today. But I think the sooner we can get on with implementing these powers, the better. And you know, I've, had a, I've had a look already at the Smith Commission clause by clause to look at what would be the necessary instruments required to take this forward. And not all of them require to wait for primary legislation. Uh, lots of them could be taken forward through Section 30 orders and legislation within this institution. Um, lots of them could be taken forward by um, intergovernmental working. And uh, so I, I don't quite understand the rationale if we want to make progress on these questions, why we have to wait to implement this as one package. Um, there have been different numbers banded around in terms of the um, control of taxation and revenue that would exist within this Parliament post-implementation of the Smith proposals. Um, can you outline the Scottish Government's position in terms of what element of this Parliament's revenue would be in direct control of any Scottish Government? The Scottish Government has undertaken this assessment um, using the detail of government expenditure and revenues in Scotland as the, the base, which is, of course, um, a national statistics approved publication. It is the authority on the public finances in Scotland. So we've used the GERS analysis as the basis of our calculations. And what that demonstrates is that the devolved taxes under Smith as a percentage of total Scottish tax revenues will be 29% under the control of the Scottish Parliament. Um, if the assignation of VET is taken into account, that figure would be 37%. So the, there, are, there are some who have suggested a figure of close to 50%. Do you have any idea of where they are arriving at that position from? Uh, n not in terms of uh, tax revenues, no. I can see no basis for that. There is a um, uh, devolved and assigned taxes as a percentage of devolved expenditure under a, well, a post-Smith environment uh, looks to me to be at 48%. Uh, that's the closest I could get to, to 50 But in terms of tax revenues, um, the, the uh, devolved taxes as a percentage of total Scottish tax revenues um, are 29% and with assignation 37%. So the 48% the figure includes revenues which are assigned but over which this Parliament and the Scottish Government would exercise no control? Well, there, is a, there, there is a difference between the two figures that I was, I was given there. Devolved taxes are taxes uh, under the control and the, de the decision-making of the Scottish Parliament, which would be 29%. But the assignation of VET, uh, we would have no ability to control that. It's, it's simply a, it's an accounting transaction which, uh, over which we have no control. David Scott. Thank you very much, uh, Convener. Uh, Deputy First Minister, I wonder if I could take you to the point you just made latterly there on intergovernmental machinery. Um, I absolutely respect the, the manner and tone and the way in which you personally have described this process and also um, the, the, in, in more latter days as well. I, I suspect you d might agree with me that that tone is quite important in terms of how intergovernmental relationships work in a constructive way for the future. And therefore, do you think using phrases like breathtaking arrogance help any of us get anything done in life? Uh, well, um, there's always words used in politics that are, um, that are, let me say, livelier than others. That was used by one of your cabinet colleagues last night and in a context of a, an issue which I think Lyndon Fabiani and I were agreeing with earlier on needs to be tackled, which is the work programme. Mm -hmm. But you know, a colleague of yours used that phrase to describe the UK government. Now, I, I take your point about politics, but that is a pretty strong way of describing something that needs to be sorted out between governments, doesn't well, it? I, I'm, well, now, that, now that I know the context of it, uh, I'm, 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 I quite understand why the words were used, because um, the, the Smith Commission uh, recommended that on the completion of the work programme contracts, these should be devolved to the Scottish Parliament, and that's in uh, the spring of 2016. And we are now being advised, uh, without our consent, that that's been delayed a year in a process which um, is not yet complete. So we have the Smith Commission recommendations, which are saying that we should have control over the work programme devolved to us at the end of the contracts, um, the Smith Commission, Mr. Smith and I, uh, Mr. Scott and I, sat there in good faith, um, believing that to be March 2016, 
and we're now being told it's going to be a year later without the consent of the Scottish Government in territory that's been absolutely material to the debate about employability. So I think um, I quite understand the, uh, why the remarks were made in that fashion and I think those remarks uh, are understandable and appropriate. Um, I think it all, I think it, what, what we get to in all of this analysis is the whole question of good faith. We need to get on in good faith. And one of the things which I think undermines that good faith is seeing the goalposts being moved on an important issue that the Smith Commission has judged upon. More except I think the, the record says that decision was taken before the Smith Commission was even a, uh, even a factor. So I, I think, think, I think it needs to be important about well, when that happened. But well, can I just press you on? I mean, I, it's interesting that uh, you've made those remarks, and I'm very grateful for your clarity and your, and your very clear clarity about... Uh, about uh, the appropriateness of those remarks. Um, would you, uh, could I take you on to the importance of the intergovernmental machinery being transparent to Parliament, subject I raised with the um, Secretary of State earlier on. Uh, would you uh, agree with his contention that in the Parliament-to-Parliament -Parliament relationships there must be much more scrutiny of how those mechanisms are to work in the future so that Parliament can adequately scrutinise government here in terms of how that relationship is to work for the future? I, I think Parliament should be able to scrutinise government to whatever extent Parliament to, uh, believes to be appropriate and government should make itself available to undertake that scrutiny. And do you have any thoughts uh, in that sense as to how that could best be done in the context of um, publication of meeting dates and what the agendas may be and so on and so forth, given these are very clearly government to government relationships? I, I'd have no difficulty with a very open, transparent approach to these okay. issues. Thank you. Morning, Good morning, uh, Deputy First Minister. I'm um, going back to uh, the the early exchange on the uh, on the issue of early transfer of of uh, powers. Um, the the Secretary of State actually said that he um, was uh, concerned about power being uh, transferred in dribs and drabs. I think was his expression. Um, presumably, you would accept that there would be there is a need for a comprehensive um, Scotland bill, and you could also see advantages to that. And I wonder if I could just ask you specifically, were there any uh, other issues in the agreement that you signed other than votes at 16 that suggested um, that the package would, be, would, would, would not be taken forward in a comprehensive way? I don't actually think um, that the Smith Commission particularly came to a view that there had to be a comprehensive one bill implementation of its propositions. I don't think that was something that we came to a conclusion about. In the, in the timetable that was set out in advance of the, the process? Well, I, well, if, well, well, well if, we're, if we're going to talk about the timetable that was set out in advance, then uh, Gordon Brown said that all of this would be done and dusted and implemented before Scotland could have become an independent country, which is March 2016. So uh, you know, that's, that's, a, you know, that's a timetable which was advertised before the process started. Uh, I don't... I, I don't um, you know, I stand to be corrected, but I cannot recall the Smith Commission coming to a conclusion that all of this had to be implemented um, as one package. With the accept, I accept there's, a, there's been a lot of commentary about 16, 17 year olds. I completely associate the government with that and that we would take um, early steps within our responsibilities to, to, to advance those arguments. But um, the, I don't see. I, I, I don't recall anything in the Smith Commission that suggested to me this had to await one legislative proposition because, as I've said to the committee already, there are a number of different routes by which the recommendations of the Smith Commission could be, um, could be implemented. Now, I think to use the terminology dribs and drabs has a certain, um, you know, conveys a certain incoherence I think I could perhaps put some more elegance into that by saying we could have an orderly staged process to implementation, uh, to coin a phrase that uh, my civil service colleagues would probably approve of. Um, but, uh, and we could do that over a reasonable time scale. Uh, and I think that's perhaps a, a slightly more elegant way to, to talk about it. Uh, nicely done, Deputy First Minister. Um, I suppose that, uh, I mean, I don't have a strong view about this uh, one way or the other, but I suppose. Um, uh, I mean, one of the issues that Lord Smith highlighted to us on Tuesday and um, discussed with the Secretary of State earlier is um, the whole issue of public understanding and, and uh, around our whole constitutional framework. And uh, for me, I would presumably see that there would be uh, advantages in having a legislative framework around uh, the powers of this Parliament that is more easily understood. And that would be, for me, a revised um, Scotland Act would seem to be the sensible 
um, way to do it. But regardless of whether or not you, you, you took a different view of, or, or, or on that point, presumably you would accept that where there was to be, if there were to be areas where you wanted early transfer or separate um, discussions around particular um, powers, the onus would be um, to a large extent on the Scottish Government to set out what its uh, objective would be in using a certain power because that would impact on the manner of its, its devolution, presumably. So on an issue like the work programme, you would need to come forward with um, a greater degree of detail than exists from the Scottish Government at the moment as to how you would envisage that programme working because that would impact on the contractual arrangements and perhaps on how, that, uh, how, you, how the power would be devolved. I, I, I don't share that view uh, at all. Uh, I think the, the devolution of power is, a, is an absolute concept. It's not, a, it's not a, a conditional concept. It's not conditional on what we decide to do with the power. We either decide it would be better to deal with it through a constitutional bill rather than through a separate process. Well, let, me, let me come on to that in a, in, a, in a moment. I think that, let me just address that first point. The, the, for me, um, if we decide to devolve a power, we devolve a power and we're then free to do with it what we wish, so, you know, consistent with the democratic consent of Parliament. I think that's how all of us found our view on the powers and the responsibilities of the Parliament. So I don't think there's any necessity for, for, for that to be the case. On the, the wider issue about public understanding, which is a point about which Lord Smith is, is very exercised, he made that absolutely crystal clear to us during the process, I, I do think there is um, a lack of understanding about where responsibilities rest for particular issues between the Scottish Parliament and the United Kingdom Parliament. With the greatest respect, I don't think that's solved by a constitutional bill. There's not, I'm not aware of many of my constituents. I can think of a few of my constituents who worked their way through the Scotland Act 1998 and the Scotland Act 2012, but there won't be many of them. I think there's a much wider question, which, the, um, which Lord Smith has correctly uh, pointed in the direction of the presiding officer and the parliamentary authorities as to how we increase awareness of what are the powers and the responsibilities of the Parliament. And that's achieved by you know, much wider approaches than just simply uh, the passing of statute. Stuart Mill. Thank you, uh, Camp, uh, Deputy First Minister. I wasn't actually intending to ask a question in this particular section, but it was one of your comments earlier uh, when you mentioned that, uh, that you've looked through each clause to see as to what, that, well, what would actually require primary legislation and what uh, doesn't. Um, so paragraphs 39 and paragraph 74 of the Smith Commission on the MCA and, uh, and the fixed odds betting terminals, would they require primary legislation, but particularly the, the issue of the, the MCA, bearing in mind the, 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 the effect or the negative effect upon uh, service provision uh, in Scotland as a consequence of the UK government's mm. cuts. 39 and which was almost uh, 74. 74. Fixed specking terminals. Um, well, I'm, 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 sorry to, I'm sorry to convey to Mr. McMillan that, uh, on my estimation, both of them require primary legislation. Oh okay. Thank you. I'd stress, uh, could I perhaps just place on the record, convener, this is the first attempt that we've had to go through clause by clause to just to be absent and. and, and, and it, yeah, it's a first sight analysis that's been done by the government's lawyers, but um, we will um, uh, we will be looking at this with uh, even greater scrutiny in the days to come. No, nobody else has indicated they want to ask a question, but I'd like a few other areas I'd like to examine with you, uh, Deputy First Minister. Uh, the Smith Commission considered that the operation of additional borrowing powers beyond the Scotland Act in 2012 has obviously got to be a matter between the UK and Scottish governments to agree. <coughs> Uh, and therefore, I'm looking for your view about how you see the, the borrowing powers that should be available to the Scottish Government should operate in practice, um, and whether the UK Government need to un underwrite a move to potential borrowings, and, and how you, you see that process going from here. There are, um, I, I see the requirement for, for borrowing to essentially be in place for, um, for two purposes. Uh, one is to support capital investment programmes and for us to be um, for us to be more significantly empowered to procure that borrowing as it suits our requirements to support capital investment um, and secondly borrowing requires to be put in place to uh, provide us with sufficient um, ability to manage the flows of revenues that will 
um, that will in become an increasingly significant part of the revenue base of the of the Scottish public of Scottish public finances. Um, we will be in a situation um, where a larger proportion of our budget is dependent on tax revenues that um, emerge. We have to have the ability to to manage those flows and to manage the um, the different performance that can take place on the revenue base. So those are the two purposes for which I see borrowing being required. I would accept that that, has to, that borrowing has to be undertaken uh, within a clearly articulated fiscal framework, both at the Scottish level and also at United Kingdom level. Now, at Scottish level, we already have the, 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 the foundations of that fiscal framework in the fact that I already publish the proportion of the budget that is um, th that is required to support revenue financed investment, essentially repayments from which we have absolutely no escape. And I've set a ceiling on that of 5% of our Dell budget. So there is a, an acceptance within our existing fiscal arrangements that there must be limitations on what we can do to guarantee sustainability, which begins to address the issue that you've raised, convener, about a prudential framework. The second element is the United Kingdom framework, and you know, I have to accept, and I accept this um, as part of the current constitutional arrangements, that whatever steps we take on borrowing must be undertaken within the wider United Kingdom fiscal framework, because the actions that we take will have a consequence on the fiscal framework of the United Kingdom and the fiscal mandate for which the Chancellor is quite within his rights entirely within his rights uh, to set and to specify for the United Kingdom economy and the management of its public finances. So whilst I would like to see us having the flexibility to, um, to commission whatever borrowing we wish to take forward for capital investment purposes, whilst I think it's essential that we have borrowing capacity to deal with the fluctuation in tax revenues, I do accept that that has to be done within an agreed fiscal framework as part of the United Kingdom under, under the current constitutional arrangements. Thank you. Uh, Linda Fabiani. Oh, right. Thank you. Hello again, <laughs> Deputy First Minister. Um, I was interested in, in what uh, Secretary of State for Scotland was saying about the additional policy matters that have been put into the uh, Smith Commission agreement. Um, and what he did say was that yes, they would be looked at, and I'm paraphrasing him, um, but he, I think he said that they looked like just some additional things that were thrown into the pot or, or words similar. Uh, he said too that, or the impression he gave me that was that before they would be discussed in any great detail, they would have to have a particular relevance to Scotland. And on the question of post-study uh, student visas, he felt that that was a, a UK issue rather than a particularly Scottish one. And in that, University of Scotland submission was very strong in this. In that, many other Civic Scotland submissions mentioned it too. I wonder if you could outline for us um, why you would feel this would be of particular relevance to Scotland and um, what kind of approaches you will be making to the Scotland office on this for early implementation. The points that um, uh, Linda Fabiana is, raises are contained in, in section 96 of the Smith Commission report and um, I certainly don't think it's appropriate to characterise these as, as things just added on at the end. These, were, um, these, were, these are substantive issues that emerged during the Smith Commission process. Um, I'd have to say that um, uh, they attracted more support or interest from different players around the table, but nonetheless they were important issues that were raised. Crucially, on the issue of um, post-study visas, um, that was an issue for which the Smith Commission took very substantial evidence from, from external organisations, particularly within the university community. and. Um, I, I think there's a, there is a very significant issue in there. Um, it's an issue that there's an aspiration in Scotland to address. And uh, I, I think as a consequence of that, um, it would be beneficial for us to advance those discussions with the United Kingdom government. That is exactly what ministers will do to take forward these issues. Um, and we look forward to 
having further discussions with UK ministers on how these can be taken forward to, to some form of resolution. So a small supplementary and we'll need to continue back into the tax arena <coughs> in terms of questions. Simply in relation to what Linda raised, Deputy First Minister, uh, I asked the Secretary of State whether he'd had representations from the Scottish Government on post-study work visas. He said he thought not in the last couple of years, but is that something you would uh, be willing and able to make representations on given the indication in the Smith Agreement that um, that is a, no, a matter for further consideration? Uh, it's certainly one that we will take forward because we very much welcome the contribution to the debate from uh, University Scotland um, who um, welcomed the fact that the Smith Commission recommended that Scotland should be able to introduce a formal post-study work scheme for international students and uh, I think it's been a pretty persistent um, aspiration from the university sector to advance on this issue. Thank you very much. To come back to the issue of taxation, there's been some discussion again in the earlier session around what the consequences are of decisions to use additional devolved powers in ways that involved additional expenditure. Are you quite clear and are you clear that you signed up to a proposition that where additional powers are devolved and decisions are taken to use those powers to increase expenditure, those are decisions for which the responsibility will lie fairly and squarely here uh, and not in any way impact upon the Bar Barnett formula? I, I think I could perhaps do with just hearing that once again from Mr McDonald because he, he ended up somewhere, somewhere where I didn't expect him to end up with that question. <laughs> Certainly. So there, there, was some, there was an exchange while the Secretary of State was here uh, around the question of whether Barnett would in some way compensate for spending decisions taken by the devolved government in devolved areas. My understanding is that once the responsibility is devolved, then the decisions are for the Scottish Government to take and uh, the tax consequences of that are borne within Scotland. Would the Deputy First Minister agree that that's his understanding too? Um, well, I think th I, I'm not sure. I, 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 I didn't hear the exchange that, uh, to which Mr. McDonald refers with the Secretary of State, so uh, you know, I'll go back and, and look at exactly what the Secretary of State has said. But um, I think it's important to remember that the, um, in the Smith Agreement at, um, at section 95.1, um, the agreement says that the block grant from the UK Government to Scotland will continue to be determined via the operation of the Barnet formula. So that's the clear continuation of the Barnet formula. Um, as it applies to changes in public expenditure in England as they affect uh, Scotland. Uh, there is subsequent to um, Clause uh, 95.1, um, there is Clause um, 95.3a, which deals with the arrangements around the initial devolution and assignation of tax receipts which will obviously lead to an, uh, an adjustment to the block grant and all of these questions will be the subject of negotiation between the Scottish and United Kingdom governments and I should add that uh, for the benefit of the committee that these issues in my experience are not easy issues to take forward given that um, I still do not have an agreement around the block grant adjustment for land and buildings transaction tax or landfill tax with the United Kingdom Government, uh, which is not for the want of trying over a two-year period. I recognise the complexity of it and indeed, uh, uh, of course, the, the, the confirmation of the Barnett formula in this agreement is very important indeed. My point is if this, a future Scottish Government chose to use the power to create, for example, additional benefits that are not uh, in existence in the rest of the United Kingdom. That would be a decision for which the responsibility would lie with the Scottish Government. I accept that, yes. Sir. Rob Gibson, in Tavish, Scott. I'd like to ask a question about the Crown of State. The Secretary of State uh, for uh, Scotland suggested that um, local authorities uh, would actually benefit uh, and coastal authorities would benefit from the Crown of State's seabed, but he made it quite clear that that was up to uh, the 12 mile limit. Uh, 
Now, in the beginning of paragraph 32 in the Smith report, it says that uh, the responsibility for the management of the Crown Estate's economic assets in Scotland and the revenue generated from these assets, etc., uh, would be uh, transferred to the Scottish Parliament. You know, um, the area beyond the 12-mile limit may contain a lot of offshore infrastructure. Is it your understanding that uh, revenues from these would come to the Scottish Parliament? My um, very clear understanding of the purpose and the import of Section 32 is that that would extend to the 200 miles limit around the coastline of Scotland. So the situation is that uh, when I questioned the Crown <coughs> Estate uh, in September last year on this matter, um, Ronnie Quinn gave the RACI committee an estimate that the income on 2020 figures from three sites in the round three, in other words, in the areas which we expect to see built, producing 1,000 megawatts, would have a, an income of around 7.6 million per annum to the Crown Estate. So that would be generated beyond the 12-mile limit. Would you expect any of that to be shared with the local authorities? Well, what, what I... What I, I think there are, there are two, two, two distinctive points here. Point one is that my very clear understanding of Clause 32 is that extends to the management of the Crown Estate's economic assets in Scotland and the revenue generated from these assets, and that would be transferred to the Scottish Parliament, and that would extend to the 200-mile limit. And that's an important fundamental point that was implicit in the agreement because the Smith Commission took a long time to address the question of whether it was the foreshore or the seabed, and the seabed goes out to 200 miles. Second point is about local authority um, a, a, a access, and that is um, essentially defined by paragraph 33, and that the um, the issue related to the foreshore activity around local authority areas uh, and obviously there are three local authority areas that are mentioned there that have specifically advanced this argument but part of what the Smith Commission also wanted to do was to make sure that there was the opportunity for areas in addition to the three island authorities who have done a fantastic job of pursuing this argument uh, were able to uh, participate in this into the bargain. Okay, thank you. Tell us Scott and then um, Mark McDonald. Thank you very much. Could I just continue that line of questioning that Rob Gibson's helpfully uh, opened up? Um, I think, Deputy First Minister, you said at the end, uh, right at the end of your remarks there, that uh, the local authorities, the three that you mentioned, could participate. Um, you will know paragraph, uh, sorry, 33, uh, paragraph 33 of the, of the Smith Agreement, where it, where it says responsibility for the management of those assets will be further devolved. Could you give the committee some indication of how you see that being... Um, done. Well, we'd see that being uh, taken forward in dialogue and discussion with the uh, relevant authorities. Uh, the three island authorities are, are, are named here, and, um, the, um, uh, and obviously we'd want to work very closely with those um, authorities as we have done to date. Mr Mackay was in Orkney on Tuesday discussing some of these issues with the uh, leadership of Orkney Islands Council. The um, Islands Prospectus that the Government put forward committed the, to the, the Government to the principle that island authorities should receive 100% of net revenues from adjacent waters to 12 nautical miles um, and a guarantee and a guaranteed a more significant role in the management of Crown Estate marine resources and uh, that would be the, 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 the policy thinking that we would bring to bear on taking forward this issue with local authorities. I, I should also stress that the, this point and a wider point that Lord Smith made, if I recall correctly, in his introduction about the desire to ensure that we devolve further responsibility from the Scottish Parliament to local authorities and local communities is a, a direction of travel which, which the government fully supports. Uh, that's 
helpful up to the, up to a point, but um, the policy direction you just indicated isn't the isn't the aspiration of the communities. There's a lot more than that because the submission, for example, from Shetlands Council was to the Smith Commission was to transfer all to local authorities all Crown Estate power and responsibilities. Uh, they didn't see a middleman here, and what you've just suggested is that you'd be the tax collector and then you'd give them a net, and I think I quote you correctly, a net amount. So uh, I think the communities are looking for rather more than just being, uh, what, how would one put it, just being consulted on, on management. They want to have the management powers for themselves. Don't you agree with that? Well, con con consulted was Mr Scott's word. It wasn't one that I used. Um, what I, what I uh, said in my, in my earlier answer is that uh, it was to re reinforce the points at Clause 33 of the Smith, uh, the, the Smith Agreement that responsibility for the management of those assets will be further devolved to local authority areas such as the three island authorities. And uh, that's what the government will, uh, will discuss uh, in the reconstituted uh, islands working group uh, that is, um, in which our interests are taken forward by Mr Mackay. Uh, I welcome that. I very, very strongly welcome that. But that's not consistent, if I may say so, Deputy First Minister, with saying we will be able to ensure that the island and coastal communities receive 100% of the net income from seabed leasing revenues. That suggests you've already decided your policy, whereas I'm suggesting actually the, the aspirations of those communities are much greater than just being on the end of a cheque. We'll be, we'll be very happy, as I've said, to discuss all of these issues with the island authorities. Uh, the government has gone to um, great lengths to ensure we have a good strong and I think positively welcome dialogue with the island authorities on these questions and we will continue in that vein. But is your mind open to much more of what 33 actually says which is the responsibility for the management of those assets being devolved rather than just being on the end of a cheque? Well I said that I endorsed uh, the contents of 33 okay. yes. Right thank you. I can check with Alison Johnson it was used to do with the Crown Estate as well Alison. Well it's to do with um, local autonomy well, just before we go there, I think we should agree that we need to, I think, write to both governments on this issue of 12 miles, 200 miles. There's been a different perspective given by both governments in this regard. And I think to be fair to the Secretary of State uh, and Mr Swinney, we should write to seek clarity to make sure we can see, come to get some agreement on this. I think that would be a useful thing for us to agree. Now, just uh, add... And add, add Obviously, I have a, an advantageous position to the Secretary of State in that I was a participant sure. in the room, which perhaps uh, gives me um, uh, more influence on this point or more perspective. But uh, the one thing, if, if I and, and please stop me if I'm if I'm going too far <coughs> in that uh, position, convener. But at Clause 34, yeah. Clause 34 was specifically written to deal with issues that arise out with the 12 mile boundary and within the 200 mile limit. So clause 34 was, believe you me, poured over significantly because it dealt with issues beyond 12 miles, which is why I was so firm and I'm absolutely firm in my 200 mile view. I, I accept entirely your point about the Secretary of State and t in terms of where he was. I think, so I'm trying to be fair to him okay. to give him a chance to reflect on his evidence by writing to him. And on the, on the local communities issue, I'll, because it's tied into the question on county states, I'll bring in Alison Johnson and then I'm going straight to Mark MacDonald. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, Deputy First Minister, you spoke about a direction of travel that would further empower local communities. And I think it's fair to say that there are many who believe that local democracy remains the unfinished business of devolution even after the Smith Commission. Um, I do think it's an area that deserves far greater attention. If you are serious about empowering local communities, do you think the fact that national government can you know, usurp local government when it comes to imposing a council tax freeze is something that needs to be looked at? Well, there's been no imposition of a council tax freeze. Every single local authority in Scotland has uh, chosen since 2000 eight and some of them before that to apply a council tax freeze for which the government has been prepared to put up the resources to enable that to happen so the um, you know I can't impose a council tax freeze um, I can provide resources to local authorities to compensate them if they opt to do so but the only people that can vote for a council tax freeze are the elected members of local authorities you will maintain that that council tax freeze is a negotiated position, but it's obviously very difficult in light of the freeze to 
but, it, you know, it makes it very difficult for local authorities to be truly empowered. Do you think the commission that's been set up on a cross-party basis to look at alternatives to council tax might look at that as an issue? Because certainly in you know, many parts of Europe, it's agreed that muni municipalities have that power and that national governments should not intervene in that way. Well, I'm, um, I'm certainly very happy to see the establishment of the commission to look at these issues around uh, local taxation. Um, the, the government has taken forward that proposal to build on recommendations made to us by the, um, the Local Government and Regeneration Committee of Parliament and I think it's a welcome opportunity for um, all interested parties, uh, including all political parties, to be involved in a process of considering uh, these questions. So I think that's, uh, I think that's uh, a welcome opportunity. In terms of the, uh, the ability of local authorities to determine their own um, priorities. I, I simply remind Alison Johnson that when this government came to office in 2007, about £2 billion worth of local authority expenditure was ring-fenced and controlled by St Andrew's House. That now amounts to virtually nothing. And the only areas where we exercise any ring fences are by agreement with local authorities because we consider it to be a sensible thing to do where it's uh, time-limited funds that, uh, with which we are dealing. So the, um, the Scottish Government has significantly um, relaxed controls that were exercised by our predecessors over local authority actions to enable local authorities to determine more of their priorities according to local needs, and we'll continue that process. Straight away a bit from the purpose of today, so I'm going to go to Mark MacDonald and then Stuart McMillan. Last two questions in tax, because I must have moved on to the welfare here. Sure, can we, um, just around the assignment on uh, VAT, um, the Secretary of State earlier when he was in, uh, I raised the, the issue with him that obviously the, the uh, rate of VAT and, and how it is applied to various sectors will obviously remain the control of the UK government. Um, what indication have you had, if any, that Scottish Government will be actively involved in discussions around that? For example, there are a number of sectors who have called for a uh, significant reduction in VAT on their particular sector. Um, ha have you had any early indications that, that Scottish Government would be actively involved in those discussions, given that a drop below 10, 10 pence, for example, or 10 percent, would obviously impact on the assignment of revenues that would come to Scotland? Um, Bluntly convenient, I think it's unimaginable that the Scottish Government will have any influence over the setting of VAT rates in the United Kingdom. Okay. Sure. Um, good morning, Deputy First Minister. Uh, I pose the question to the Secretary of State regarding the issue of corporation tax, and paragraph 82 uh, in the Smith Commission report also indicates that, uh, that, that all aspects of corporation tax will remain reserved. So, and uh, also we heard yesterday regarding well, the issue of corporation tax being devolved to Northern Ireland. Um, what are your thoughts on, uh, on the issue of corporation tax being devolved there and, uh, and also not coming to Scotland? Clearly the, uh, the issue in relation to um, devolution of corporation tax to Northern Ireland has been one that has been advanced by <coughs> our counterparts in Northern Ireland and they are absolutely free and welcome to take forward that, uh, that argument and uh, I'm, I'm certainly uh, very satisfied they've put forward um, a set of arguments um, that have supported their proposition. Um, I do rather vest my arguments in this question on the conclusions of the uh, Scotland Bill Committee in this Parliament prior to the 2011 election where the view was taken uh, within that committee that if there was to be devolution of corporation tax to one part of the United Kingdom, it should also be available to other parts of the United Kingdom, including Scotland, and I think that would be a, a fair way to proceed, given that would be one of the economic levers that we could utilise to strengthen the performance of the Scottish economy. Do you see the, the, the issue of corporation tax, and uh, if it were to be devolved to Scotland, do you see it actually as a, as a means of actually creating jobs? It, well, it's one, the, it's one of the economic levers to which I referred earlier on in my answer to the convener, and I think it's, it's one of a number of different um, economic instruments that would be beneficial for us to utilise to work to strengthen the Scottish economy. Thank you. Drew Smith. 
Thanks very much. Um, uh, convener, just to, to uh, on, still on the the issue of um, corporation tax. I mean, of course, if you go back and read the, the whole report of the Scotland Bill Committee, it certainly doesn't make an argument for devolution um, of corporation tax. And th I suppose the, uh, the, the, the important principle that Lord Smith himself gave to the committee on Tuesday was that um, the agreement that was reached across all the parties was um, that it should proceed on the basis of what was in the best interest of Scotland. It was not remotely contingent uh, upon changes uh, elsewhere in the United Kingdom, and Lord Smith was very clear about that. But I think he brought it up uh, without even being asked the question about um, Northern Ireland. So he was certainly um, extremely clear, and presumably you would um, accept from the, the Smith Commission process that, that your view now on corporation tax is a, is a fairly isolated one. Lord Smith um, was clear that business doesn't support this, that the unions don't support this, that the submissions um, to the Commission didn't support it, and, and clearly it was just, uh, unfortunately for those people who believe in it, an area where there is no consensus that this would be in Scotland's interest, Deputy First Minister. Well, it's not the only one where there's not consensus, because if we flip the whole question on its head and say, let's look at the evidence on some other questions, other questions said that we should almost, to exception, Civic Scotland said we should have complete control over the welfare system. Almost without exception, Civic Scotland said we should have control over the minimum wage. Almost without exception, Civic Scotland said we should have the devolution of equalities legislation. We've got none of those. Now, out there, Civic Scotland wanted all these things. And if we apply the same test that Mr Smith is applying to this, that we should be listening to what all the external bodies of opinion... Are, well, well, let, let, allow me to finish my answer. If we're going to listen to what all the external bodies are saying, and we come to the, so the external bodies say we don't want devolution of corporation tax, so we don't get corporation tax. So all the external bodies say we should have control over the minimum wage, we should have control over equalities, we should have control of the welfare system, and the Smith Commission said to them, no, we're not agreeing to that. So... I think there's a fundamental illogicality in the argument that Drew Smith has advanced. Well, well it, it, if there was, Deputy First Minister, then it would equally apply when those people uh, make the same argument uh, on the other side. So we can perhaps uh, agree to differ on whether uh, consensus from uh, submissions um, uh, is the issue at hand. And I want to go back, I suppose, to, to the point I, was, uh, I perhaps didn't get across, which is the principle of what Lord Smith um, set out and, as I say, brought up himself to the committee on Tuesday, which was we should proceed on the basis of what is in the best interest of Scotland. And Lord Smith was very clear um, that that was the principle in which uh, the Commission had come to agreement and that that was not remotely contingent upon the position in Northern Ireland or elsewhere. I, um, I, I proceed every day of my life, I proceed on the basis of what I think is in the best interest of Scotland. Uh, but I do accept that I'll have a different view of what's in the best interests of Scotland than what Mr Smith, or uh, this Mr Smith, uh, as opposed to Lord Smith, only a matter of time, I suspect, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, the, um, uh, 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 takes on, on, on any of these questions. Uh, and because it's a, you know, we all come to a judgment about what we think to be in the best interests of Scotland. I think it would be in the best interests of Scotland for us to have a range of, uh, of, of economic levers to enable us to strengthen the performance of the Scottish economy. I've made no secret of that view. Um, and uh, in some respects, those priorities are supported by external organisations. In some uh, respects, they're not supported by external organisations. But they're my views about how I think Scotland should proceed and how we should use all of the economic opportunities at our disposal. Could, could just very finally, um, uh, convener, you, you mentioned earlier in the, the initial discussion on this also the, the issue of national insurance, and clearly the Scottish Government's position uh, in seeking the power of corporation taxes to make a cut um, to that tax. Um, what would be your objective if you, if you another, the other lever you identified in terms of national insurance, would you also be seeking to cut tax there? Well, employers' national insurance contributions are um, a, a key factor in the cost of employment, and if we are if we are intent on trying to encourage and to support the growth of high quality employment in Scotland, one of the levers we could use is to make it more affordable for, for, for companies to take on staff. Now, clearly, if there is, um, if there is a, a financial implication of all of that, government has to address that within its, its, its costed programme. But what it would strike me as has been a beneficial lever to have at our disposal to assist companies to take on more staff, 
to have more taxpayers to boost the public purse as a consequence of having more employees in employment, generating thereafter better stronger public finances and the ability to invest in our economy. Right. Well, so it was for the purpose of tax cutting? It's for the purpose of economic growth. Right. Uh, last question in this area, Linda Fabiani, and then I'm moving on to welfare issues. Just a, a comment from me, convener. Thank you. I just thought it would be worth reminding everyone that the Calman Commission, uh, which had three of the parties here on, it said quite clearly that the reserved position on corporation tax should uh, Northern Ireland be given devolution in that regard. Record. Um, can we move on to the, the, the welfare area now, uh, Deputy First Minister? And I just want to come back to you in the same way as I did with the Secretary of State. And I'm sorry you have not had the benefit like the Secretary of State this morning didn't have the benefit either of seeing the paper that was produced for myself in regard to universal credit and impacts thereon. Uh, but I just want to tell you what it says, and you, you might want to think about it, and like the Secretary of State might want to come back to us. But on the response I received from the Scottish Parliament's research service um, and its control committee members that states that if the Scottish Parliament were to top up reserved benefits, then a recipient of universal credit would receive a corresponding reduction in the universal credit payment. Now, I'm assuming from that 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 would also, be, would also impact on devolved powers as well, given the paragraph 55 of the Smith Commission's report and the way it's written. Uh, so I've got real concerns about this because it really means if, if we've got these additional powers um, coming to us in benefits, if that's accurate, and in some ways, one of the significant levers that we have would be to remove from us. And I don't know if, if you can respond to it just now, or I'd rather take a bit of time to... Do, no, I'm, quite, I'm, I'm happy to respond to it. I think that would be um, a travesty if that was the case, because Section 55, um, the purpose of Section 55 was to put into the Smith Commission report a guarantee that if the Scottish Parliament was to decide to do anything in relation to welfare, then the individual who was to be the beneficiary of that should get that benefit, and it shouldn't be... Well, uh, Section 55, um, I think, highlights the danger very directly. It says, should not result in an automatic offsetting reduction in their entitlement to other benefits. Uh, that would be, you know, that to me is pretty clear that anything that we do within the Scottish Parliament should not see the benefit of that uh, undermined or negated in any way uh, as it affects the individual. Certainly, in reading this, the Smith Commission, you would think that was the spirit of the intent. That's the spirit but of it, it, yes. But it is a complicated and complex area, and, we, and it's something that requires clarity. Yeah, I, I accept that, Kavina, but certainly from, you know, again, without, you know, without wishing to... Um, uh, without wishing to tread over the line of my participation in the Smith Commission, uh, that was certainly my view of the purpose of paragraph 55. Well, to refer to the Secretary of State, he said he would come back to us and write it, and you've made your position absolutely yeah. clear in that regard. Has anybody else got any other questions on welfare? Yes. yes. <coughs> thank, thank you very much, Commissioner. Yeah, can I ask a couple of things on um, Scottish Government policy or preparedness for policy? One of the provisions in paragraph 45 is the power for the Scottish Parliament, Scottish Government to vary the housing element of universal credit. It's the one exception uh, in relation to the reservation of universal credit. Um, and there are a number of different aspects of this which would uh, apply. I wonder if the Scottish Government has given thought as to how this might be uh, constructively done in the context uh, of the, the uh, proposed split between reserved and devolved uh, powers uh, uh, around welfare benefits. Um, the, uh, I think to go back to the, um, the, the ground I covered earlier, um, our initial um, assessment is that primary legislation would be required to amend at least the Scotland Act um, 1998. It, m it perhaps could be undertaken um, through a Section 30 order. Um, uh, but there may also be, and this would perhaps be why primary legislation would be required, uh, there may also be uh, wider changes required to social security legislation into the bargain. So 
um, I think there's, there's quite a lot of ground to cover there to determine what would actually be the mechanism, the, the legislative mechanism for enabling Clause 45 to be enacted. So, 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 there's, so clearly an area where more work is done. In, in policy terms, have, has there been an opportunity yet to think as to how such a power might most usefully be deployed uh, by the Scottish Government in the event that those technical issues are, are dealt with? There are two points I would raise there. First is that obviously we have a long-standing uh, opposition to the bedroom tax, which is the under-occupancy charge as it's referred to in paragraph 45, and um, it would be an early priority of the Scottish Government to, to wish to remove that from the statute book. Um, the second is, uh, is how this power and responsibility could be deployed in a complementary fashion to our wider housing policy. And of course, um, we do have um, particular approaches within our housing policy that are designed to support and to um, enhance the circumstances of individuals um, who, who require uh, support through the benefit system and the opportunity to integrate um, many of these interventions would be, uh, would be welcome. Thank you very much. On, on, on a different tax area, a uh, welfare area, but a similar question, um, when the Secretary of State was asked this morning about work programme and also about DLA and PIPs, his responses were in terms that he, he wanted to know what the Scottish Government proposed uh, with these policies in order for discussions to be held, for example, between the DWP and, and Scottish Government around the transfer of responsibilities and so on. Are these conversations that have begun at any level between governments? Are they conversations that have begun within the Scottish Government as to how the devolved work programme powers, for example, would be deployed and how that transition could best be managed? Well, what we've certainly been focusing on on the work programme is how we could uh, timorously and effectively devolve the, have the responsibility devolved at the end of the contract in March 2016. Um, and, and obviously that's a, a very live issue just now because we're not, you know, we're certainly, there's certainly been contact between the Scottish and United Kingdom governments on this question as Mr Scott and I discussed earlier on this morning. Um, so, uh, I, I, and the, I answered a question in Parliament on Tuesday about the fact that I would like to see the work programme more effectively aligned with the interventions that we make through third sector organisations and local authority programmes um, to ensure that we could best meet the, the needs in very specific uh, local labour markets uh, to the best of our ability. So the, um, that would be the approach that we would take on the, the work programme. On the question of um, uh, disability living allowance and the rollout of personal independence payments, the Scottish Government um, has indicated that we would uh, and I made this clear to Parliament on Tuesday that we would like to see the rollout of personal independence payments uh, brought to a halt in Scotland um, and we certainly don't want to see uh, and we'd like to see the power transferred before the 20% cut to PIP which is um, a proposition uh, of the United Kingdom Government. Thank you very much. Um, Stuart Mellon, and listen, we've only got less than 10 minutes now so we'll have to rattle, rattle on a bit here. Thank you. Certainly much of the area has been covered in that, but, uh, but just I think there's a, there's a comment I think would be very useful um, just to, to put to the Cabinet Secretary and well, Deputy First Minister, and that's uh, from Jackie Brock, uh, the Children and Scotland Chief Executive, uh, on the issue of uh, welfare. Uh, she is quoted as saying, I'm concerned that vulnerable families in Scotland may face even more complexity around welfare payments as a result of these transfers. Uh, and with, uh, with what you just had to say there a moment ago, uh, regarding the, the issue of PIP and DLA uh, and also the issue of the extension to the, to the, program for the, the work programme. Um, do you agree with the comments from Jackie Brock on this particular issue? In a sense, my response goes back to my answer to Mr Macdonald some time ago where he and I parted company on the word coherence. Um, I think the, the danger of the changes that... Um, um, are recommended by the Smith Commission is that we don't have the ability to put in place all the coherence, all the simplification, 
all of the streamlining of the welfare system to make it much more accessible for vulnerable individuals than could and should be the case. And uh, that, you know, that lack of coherence, I think, is something uh, about which we have to be mindful. And we obviously have a duty in implementation to ensure that as this whole programme is taken forward, we do so in a fashion that has the, the citizen absolutely centre stage in our thinking about how this should be implemented to meet their needs. OK, uh, again, I'll stress, let me do this quickly. Mark McDonald, Alec Johnson. Yeah, yeah come here. It goes more generally than perhaps touching on a specific benefit, but there, there appears to have been a line uh, in, in terms of the, the discussion um, from some around the way that intergovernmental relations work that would appear to suggest that the, the Scottish Government bears the, the sole responsibility on that. And given that the Secretary of State for Scotland in his uh, answers earlier appeared to indicate that there was no appetite from the UK government to uh, take the approach on DLA and PIP that, that the Cabinet Secretary outlines. Does he think that that is unhelpful from an improvement of intergovernmental relations approach? There is a, there's a lot of work goes on between Scottish and United Kingdom governments which is um, it's good joint working, it, it works in orderly fashion. Um, there are other areas where there's room for significant improvement and generally the areas where there's room for significant uh, improvement is where we've got a disagreement about how we should proceed in many of these areas of policy, which is why I get very frustrated by having decisions taken in London of which I completely disapprove. And it's at the heart of my frustration about many of the choices that we have to make. Um, so. In, in trying to resolve these issues, um, we have to have better intergovernmental machinery, but we shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't um, try to persuade ourselves that all of the disagreements that we'll have will disappear with, with lovely intergovernmental machinery. We'll still disagree about certain <laughs> things because we have different views about things, and that's, you know, that's a, that's a, a, a hard uh, kind of difficulty of politics. Minister, there is already a significant divergence uh, between uh, the cost uh, of welfare in Scotland as a result of decisions already made to diverge in policy, and I think there's £100 million plus uh, in your current budget that accounts for that. Uh, are we proper, do we have a proper understanding of what the nature of that divergence in cost will be as policy diverge, diverges? And are we properly taking into account the potential impact of the Barnett formula uh, on the cost of the Scottish Government in future? For example, you suggested a moment ago that you would like to see personal independence payments or their equivalent devolved before they're subject, subject to a 20% cut. But surely, even if they were devolved before that 20% cut, that 20% cut would be delivered via the Barnett formula. Um, the I wouldn't see how that would be uh, deployed as part of the Barnett formula because the, the Barnett formula uh, relates to um, uh, specific programmes in existence in England and Wales and uh, the, essentially comparators are based as a calculation on, on those different programmes. I think there's two points to, to look at what Mr Johnson has, has said there. The first is about um, the provisions that we make for welfare payments. We, as a, a government, make a choice, and obviously there's widespread parliamentary support for what we're doing, to um, make provision for additional welfare support through the Scottish Welfare Fund or through the mitigation of the bedroom tax. Um, that We have to find that resource from within our existing budget, and it has to be done on a sustainable basis, and that's, that was essentially the turning point of the budget in February of this year. So those choices are there, and they're, they're, they're done in a transparent way. The second point is in relation to, um, and it's a similar point, as these uh, powers are devolved to us, there will be further calls on the on on the Scottish Government to do certain things. Uh, but the test that will have to be applied is whether we can find the resources to support them. And that's where I would have liked to have seen the Smith Commission giving us greater ability to improve economic performance, which would then have enabled us to better afford some of these uh, opportunities. 
you would concede that uh, given the, the cost of the limited divergence we've already seen in welfare programmes, that the kind of powers that are being uh, proposed to be passed have the potential for quite substantial divergence in terms of budget. Uh, the, 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 there is certainly the opportunity for divergence of programme, uh, but, the, but my core point to Mr Johnson is that uh, these provisions have got to be f supported financially and a Scottish Government would have to have the adequate resources to do so. Okay, final question, very quick question, because I must finish this for half past 11. Thank you. Uh, Convener, um, uh, one issue that, we, that was raised uh, and, and is in, a set, in some sense there might be a agreement or disagreement with this outstanding from the report is the, the issue of, uh, of abortion. Now I think um, I would like to pursue the issue of the purpose of any devolution of abortion with the Scottish Government if it was the intention uh, to, to continue to seek um, its uh, devolution but the Convener indicates we don't have time to, to deal with that today so it's just a simple, uh, a very simple question which is is the Scottish Government continuing to seek uh, the devolution of, of powers in that area? Well, the Scottish Government believes that um, all areas of legislative competence should be in the possession of the Scottish Parliament. So, that's, that's, so in a sense, that's my answer to Drew Smith. Um, yes, we seek these powers because they're part of the remaining powers at Westminster that we would like to see exercised by the Scottish Parliament. On the very specific issue of abortion, um, there were discussions within the Smith Commission on this question and uh, the view was formed that the, uh, the, the Commission was minded to devolve, a, to recommend a devolution of abortion to the Scottish Parliament, but that that issue should be considered further with a variety of remaining health reservations that exist um, in, within the Scotland Act of 1998. Okay, well, thank you very much, colleagues. Thank you very much, Dear First Minister. I think we've had a, a good session this morning. I'm very grateful for you giving me some of your time. I'll move straight on to ag agenda item three, delegation of authority to, for witness expenses, and I invite the committee to agree to delegate to me the authority to reimburse suitable witness expenses if required to any future witnesses. Have we agreed? Agreed. A, some people are looking a bit askance at that idea, but we're agreed in general terms. Um, uh, that's it. And at the end of the meeting, I'll just re remind colleagues that we'll meet again next Thursday and we'll have a range of evidence from academic experts on the report of the Smith Commission. And thank you very much, and we've made it with 25 seconds to go. Thank you. Bye.